afternoon of May 4th. Tony, could you please call the roll? Jimenez? Morales? Here. Cohen? Here. Roscoe? Here. Davis? Here. Ms. Barza? Arenas? Here. Foley? Mayhan? Here. Jones? Ricardo. Present. You have a quorum. Thank you, Tony. If you're able, please join us as we uh, stand to pledge allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, today's invocation will be provided uh, by San Jose City College Professor Jesus Covarrubias. Councilmember Carrasco will tell us more. Welcome, Professor. Well, hi there. Good afternoon. And welcome, uh, Professor. Today, I'm excited to have Professor Jesus Covarrubias uh, with us as we kick off a very eventful May of invocations but especially today as we celebrate and honor Cinco de Mayo, a day of celebration and celebrated by our very large Mexican American community, especially in our beautiful east side of San Jose. I personally took a little spin this weekend with my pollitos. And let me tell you, it was a special kind of beautiful as the tricolor uh, waved over my mommy mobile. Professor Cubarubias has an impressive resume, but more impressive, in my opinion, is his pedigree. He was born and raised on the east side of Salinas to working class parents. And in 1992, he earned a bachelor's of arts degree in Chicano studies and music at UC Berkeley. He then returned to his hometown of Salinas to teach elementary school. And in 1995, Professor Cubarubias received a master's degree in education and teaching credential from Stanford University. He completed doctoral coursework towards a PhD in education with an emphasis in sociology of education at UC Santa Cruz. He has been a full-time professor of ethnic studies and music at San Jose City College and is a lecturer at San Jose State University. Professor Cubarrubias' research interests include Mexican American culture, history, Chicana X, Latinx music, and Latina, Latino X educational pipeline. But hey, if that has not impressed you enough, let me tell you, we have a rock star among us. Professor Cubarrubias is an accomplished musician and composer. He plays the guitar, keyboard, alto, saxophone, an accordion. By the way, the accordion is an essential instrument for the music from my hometown in Durango, Mexico. Just a little tidbit. <clears throat> By the way, he also joined Dr. Loco's Rockin' Jalapeño Band, which became one of the Bay Area's most critically acclaimed Latino bands. He is the music director for El Teatro Campesinos uh, and has overseen the productions of La Pastorela, Corridos, Bandido, Virgen de Tepeyac, and the uh, Zoot Suit Productions. In a time of civil unrest and with a renewed sense of pride and focus on our beautiful east side of San Jose, it is befitting that someone of such high caliber is here to speak with us on the eve of the anniversary of the Battle of Puebla. Welcome, Professor. It is a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much, City Councilwoman, for that uh, very uh, long intro that I <clears throat> had sent you. Uh, I always uh, I'm very humbled to, um, and an honor to be here today because I, I have uh, many friends, including uh, Mayor Ricardo, that I respect immensely and the work that you all do here. Um, and um, it is a bit of a challenge to ask a professor to speak for only five minutes, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my very, very best to do this um, uh, with is oftentimes a lecture of an hour or more. Um, but um, I think there are a couple of things I can, I can point to. Uh, that you may find uh, um, interest in terms of the historical context of Cinco de Mayo. Uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of folks often um, 
think that this is purely a Mexican holiday. And it actually, uh, according to, <clears throat> I like my friend, Dr. Hay, uh, David Hayes Bautista refers to it as an, uh, an American tradition, actually, uh, in that if you uh, have studied much of Mexico's history, you know that uh, both of uh, the United States and Mexico are very much intertwined in our histories. Um, and, um, and of course, uh, Mexico actually received its, uh, its independence from Spain uh, prior uh, to uh, the, uh, the, the Civil War in the United States. And so what that means is that um, slavery was abolished in Mexico before it was abolished in the United States. Uh, women had the right to own land in Mexico before they had the right to own land in the United States. Um, and so I, I say this because um, if you look at the trajectory of the timeline of history, by the time of the Civil War, um, you know, Mexico had actually uh, just prior to that been invaded uh, by the French. And the, the, the French uh, had intentions of actually reinstating uh, slavery and supporting the South. Um, and um, and during, during that time, um, there were already uh, Mexican people living, of course, in California um, and throughout the Southwest uh, when it became uh, incorporated into the United States after the U.S.-Mexico War. Um, and and uh, including in El Pueblo de San Jose de Guadalupe, right? Uh, where you had many uh, Mexican Americans by virtue of the Treaty of Hidalgo uh, were now citizens of the United States, but, but many of them had a hard time understanding why uh, there was still slavery in the United States. And I think during the time of the Black Lives Matter that we're in, it's important to note that, uh, that in Mexico, uh, the abolishment of slavery was a big deal, uh, particularly because it also impacted uh, mixed race people. Um, there were uh, certainly um, limits placed on on people if they had a mixed race background. So, so it's important to to look at the context of Cinco de Mayo in this way because we can we can certainly see that um, it's a celebration that is rooted in um, liberation of people and uh, to to free people uh, from the bondage of things like slavery. Uh, and so. Um, Interestingly enough, however, uh, San Jose, just like many cities throughout the United States, had uh, a long history of celebrating Cinco de Mayo. Actually, San Jose has, uh, for many years, had the largest gatherings, I think, uh, well over 5,000 plus people in the downtown area at its peak. Um, but unfortunately, we've seen over the years is uh, a, a sort of a commercialization of this holiday and a cultural appropriation of the holiday, where instead of thinking about liberation and independence and what that means for human beings, uh, we came to associate Cinco de Mayo with, um, you know, Corona, Budweiser, and all of the sort of marketing that, that, that goes on in many of our communities. Um, this started, by the way, in the, in the, in the, during the 1980s, there was heavy, heavily marketing that was going on in Latino communities. And we started seeing an increase in um, alcohol and tobacco related illness in our community uh, that was um, very much correlated to this increase in the marketing. Um, I was very proud to see East San Jose actually uh, started a campaign to quote, take back Cinco de Mayo during that time. And, and I would urge all of us as leaders in, in the community to think about what it means to celebrate culturally responsibly, you know, in a, in a way that is uh, respectful of the history and the traditions. Uh, and and um, as you may have heard in my intro, the intro today, I, I uh, in my other life, I am a musician and I understand the idea of celebration, party, festivities, I get it. Um, but I think that there's, it's an important thing to note that, that we, can, we can celebrate and honor the traditions of many cultures uh, that represent the United States, but we can also uh, do it in a way that honors the people, their history, their traditions. Um, and I, I cringe when I would see it when I was a college student and see fraternities and sororities sort of, um, you know, sort of swinging maracas around and wearing sombreros and carrying on in ways that don't seem very respectful. So I say this because I think that um, it's, it's incumbent on us to, to take on that responsibility as we go forward to celebrate the diversity that we have in our community, to do it in a culturally responsible way uh, and in a festive way. 
And so I, I hope that that's the spirit with which you all uh, consider uh, how we celebrate Cinco de Mayo in the great city of San Jose. Thank you. Well said, thank you, Professor. Uh, very much appreciate those insights. Council member, did you want to say anything further? Uh, I appreciate uh, your presence and I appreciate your words of wisdom and all of the research and uh, the work that you've done. And of course, uh, during this time, especially uh, uh, your guiding voice uh, as we lead our, our youth uh, in, in the decisions that they make for themselves and, uh, and, and as they're emerging in their own truth and in their own power, uh, uh, their voices are becoming so powerful. This is uh, especially true now as uh, we talk about so many issues that are going to become so important uh, in, in the next uh, several months even uh, as we talk about recovery from COVID, but, uh, but that couldn't be uh, more truer now than ever. So thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Professor Guevara. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so thank much you. for being with us. All right. Uh, we will then move now to orders of the day. Uh, I know that Council Member Fowler would like to adjourn this meeting in memory of Natalia Lopez, let me ask, does anyone on the council have any changes to the printed agenda? Okay, Council Member Foley. Thank you, Mayor. Today, the San Jose City Council is adjourning this meeting in honor and memory of Natalia Smut Lopez, an Afro Rican transgender woman of San Jose and beloved drag artist and entertainer of the South Bay. Natalia was senselessly killed on April 23rd in Milpitas, California. She was best known for her powerful energy, motivating and creative spirit, captivating performances, and for her ability to fearlessly live her truth. She is the 17th victim this year of anti-transgender violence in the United States. The city of San Jose remembers, cherishes, honors, and celebrates the life of Natalia Smut Lopez. Anti-transgender violence disproportionately impacts transgender women of color. These victims were killed by acquaintances, partners, or strangers, some of whom have been arrested and charged, while others have yet to be identified. Some of these cases involve clear anti-transgender bias. In others, the victim's transgender status may have put them at risk in other ways such as forcing them into unemployment, poverty, homelessness, and or survival sex work. It should be known, Natalia was a victim of intimate partner violence, and she is also identified as transgender. Transgender individuals experience intimate partner violence at a significantly higher rate than heterosexual women. In 2020, the Human Rights Campaign tracked a record number of violent fatal incidents against transgender and gender non-conforming people. A total of 44 fatalities were tracked by HRC, marking 2020 as the most violent year on record since HRC began tracking these crimes in 2013. In these statistics, we find intersections of racism, sexism, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, and many of these transgender women are deprived of employment, housing, healthcare, and other necessities. This tragic death hit the South Bay LGBTQ plus community especially hard. As many have heard, a vigil was held at San Jose City Hall on Saturday, April 24th. Natalia was also memorialized by queer artists who included her in the recently revealed community district mural, and the community lights have been changed to trans themed colors in honor of Natalia. And if you read the Mercury News, the mural's picture was on the front page of the local section today. To honor Natalia's life further, and in conjunction with council member Carrasco, we will be lighting up the San Jose City Hall tower and rotunda light in transgender colors, blue, light pink, and white from May 7th through May 13th. And with, this, and with this adjournment too, we aim to let the whole community know, and especially those that knew Natalia, that the city of San Jose stands firmly with our transgender community. And with that, I'd like to uh, invite Councilmember Carrasco to say a few words. 
Thank you, Council Member Foley. Uh, my heart, uh, as as you mentioned, my heart goes out to all those who knew and who loved Natalia. I didn't have the grace of knowing her, unfortunately, but I hear that she was an amazing woman who through art of drag discovered her identity. I heard about her aspirations to make it into RuPaul's Drag Race. And it's a show that I watched with my children. And I thought about how wonderful it would have been to have seen her and what violence does uh, when it cuts our aspirations short. And so uh, for a woman like Natalia, who believed in second, third, and infinite amount of chances, by the way, a value that we should all aspire to, uh, we, we must always remember that in a, in a uh, relationship where intimate violence is a part of it, it's a very complicated relationship. Intimate violence is very complicated, but we have to reach out, support each other, and reassure each other that love isn't meant to be hurtful. Love is meant to be supportive. And for those who are involved in a relationship where there is domestic violence, where there is intimate uh, uh, violence, there is help out there. And of course, Next Door Solutions has been a wonderful, wonderful partner uh, to our families and to our uh, uh, women and to those uh, survival, survivors of, uh, of intimate violence and has a, a great support uh, network for our LGBTQ and trans um, community. And that number is 408-279-2962. Again, uh, leaving a person who is hurting you does not mean that you don't love that person. It just means that we want the pain to stop. And so abuse is never okay, especially because our transgender community faces so many challenges when it comes to domestic violence. Please, please make sure to get the help that you need. This is not a private matter. This is a public health crisis. We stand with you and may Natalia rest in peace and rest in power. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Councilmember Perales. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just just briefly, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Natalia's family this past Friday uh, when we unveiled the mural on Lights and Alley. Um, and uh, I encourage all my colleagues to to go down and, and take a look at the mural. We have been uh, pridifying Post Street for the last couple of years now, and uh, it's a, a tremendous space to be able to to, to honor and recognize. Uh, our LGBTQ plus community. Uh, and you'll see on the mural there, uh, a timeline of, of, of influencers um, in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and obviously the memorialization as well as, as Natalia there in, in the murals. But I just think it's, it's, uh, it, it's a great space, um, but, but speaking uh, to, I think the, the unfortunate truths, uh, while the muralists were painting that uh, over the course uh, of a couple of weeks, they were getting harassed um, by people that would would come by um, uh, that were anti-LGBTQ, and um, it you know again the fight is still continues. Um, and so I think as much as we can show our support, um, I think uh, as especially as as city leaders, um, it, it really makes a huge difference. And so I, I definitely encourage my um, my colleagues to go down and and take a look uh, and see how um, how that area is is transforming. So and, and thank you uh, to my colleagues for for honoring Natalia. Great, thank you. All right, any other comments? All right, thank you. And the mural is beautiful. I was able to see it from yesterday. All right, uh, we're on to uh, the. I'm sorry, we have to vote still on orders of the day, don't we? I think we need a motion. So moved. Second. All right, let's vote on the motion. Jimenez? Yes. Carlos? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? 
Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're on to the closed session report, Norm. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we do not have anything to report out of closed session today. Thank you. All right, we're on to the consent calendar then. And there are items I know some council members would like to pull. Council member Prowls would like to pull item 2.8, which is South Bay Clean Creeks Coalition Commendation. And Council member Crosco would like to pull uh, item 2.11, which is Melanoma Awareness Month. Are there any other items pulled? Okay, Council member Prowls. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, and it's a pleasure of mine to recognize the South Bay, uh, South Bay Clean Creeks uh, for all that they do to beautify our creeks and uh, communities. South Bay Clean Creeks Coalition is a nonprofit organization that was established in 2013 by uh, Steve Holmes, and they are dedicated to reclaiming, restoring, and revitalizing the creeks and rivers within Santa Clara County uh, watershed. Some of their restoration efforts include removing barriers for the natural wildlife uh, to be able to thrive and removing invasive plants to help create a beautiful natural environment for all to enjoy. And over the years, they have organized over 300 cleanups within Santa Clara County, and they've had over 15,250 volunteer hours accumulated and have collected over 400 tons of trash. Uh, South Bay Clean Creeks also participates in the National Cleanup River Day, providing additional support and resources to our creeks by hosting a cleanup day uh, in the community. And uh, personally, having been able to participate in uh, several of these cleanups, uh, I can uh, clearly see, and one can clearly see the passion and drive that Steve and his team have in beautifying our creeks and creating a welcoming place for both the natural habitat that lives there and for members of our community that visit these places. Uh, so it's my pleasure to be able to recognize the South Bay Clean Creeks for all of their countless hours, dedication, and commitment to keeping uh, our Santa Clara County creeks and rivers thriving. Um, and uh, I do believe we have uh, Carol uh, Shimkovich, uh, the operations manager for South Bay Clean Creeks Coalition, uh, who uh, is here and would like to say a few words on this item and I'll, I'll move approval. Second. Motion and second. And Carol, welcome. Thank you. Um, Mayor Licardo, city council members, and especially council member Perales, on behalf of Steve Holmes, founder of and director of South Bay Clean Creeks Coalition, I want to thank you for this recognition. Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Since inception eight years ago, South Bay Clean Creeks has conducted over, as, as Councilman Perales said, over 300 cleanups, picked up close to a million pounds of trash and all this could not have happened without the almost 8,000 volunteers giving their time to this cause. As a side note, last Saturday, sponsored by Valley Water, supported by Beautify SJ, South Bay Clean Creeks, along with our partner Trash Punks and 81 volunteers in two hours took 19.3 tons of trash from Coyote Creek at Tully Ball Fields. 19.3 tons and there was more. Steve is passionate about restoring our rivers and creeks to levels of cleanliness that allow wildlife to thrive. Witness the return of the beaver in Campbell. They're up there, the family's there, happy to show you anytime you want to see them. And join us to watch the fall salmon come back to our creeks and rivers. Despite the challenges, South Bay Clean Creeks Coalition preserves perseveres to reclaim, restore, and revitalize the watershed in Santa Clara County. Again, thank you for this recognition. All right, thank you. Okay, um, let's move on then, unless there are other comments. Let's go to item 2.11, which is Melanoma Awareness Month. And Councilman Carrasco. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Thank you for allowing me to do this uh, on a yearly basis. Um, raising awareness of melanoma is very personal to me. As you know, my mother passed away uh, because of skin cancer, and it is a growing concern across the U.S. Uh, over 5 million people will be diagnosed with some sort of skin cancer. Uh, melanoma, of course, being one of the deadliest of all of the skin cancers. And uh, one out of five Americans will be diagnosed with skin cancer in their lifetime. 
Uh, it is estimated that approximately 7,000 people will die of melanoma this year alone. <clears throat> it's a disease that can strike at any time. One case of sunburn alone can easily lead to developing melanoma later on in your life. Children are especially vulnerable. And, uh, and as, as I mentioned, uh, my mother passed away of melanoma, but she uh, developed melanoma uh, 13 years before her death. It started off very typically with a tiny little blemish that soon was discovered to be cancerous. And that led to a, a little biopsy, which was on the side of her nose. During surgery, it was discovered that it had become extremely aggressive, growing what they call tentacles or uh, little, uh, little arms that sprouted out underneath the skin. And as they dug deeper and deeper, this led to the complete amputation of her nose. This was followed by weeks of very painful radiation, months of healing, and years of cosmetic reconstructive surgery. 13 years later, while I was here on council right before my reelection, the cancer returned, this time invading the rest of her body and taking my mother from me. Her story is not unusual. Skin cancer, uh, when gone untreated or when detected all too late, uh, takes these kinds of turns. It can either be deadly or can be disfiguring, but it can also be preventable. If you take the proper measures, you can avoid a lifetime of pain and, uh, and you can enjoy your loved ones for a lifetime as well. So what do we need to do? Well, if at all possible, avoid the sun during the hours of 11 to four. I know that that's very difficult, but if you must be out in the sun, then layer up. I drive with uh, long sleeve shirts and believe it or not, I've become that person that puts gloves on when I drive. I'm not afraid of the, the I'm not afraid of the comments or the, or the criticism anymore. I wear long rimmed hats at this point, wherever I go. Uh, but the most important thing is know your sunscreen and understand the SPF. They recommend 30 and above. And what this basically means is uh, the higher you go, the, the greater the UVB light um, filtering um, is, uh, is, uh, is pro uh, you're protected from the UV uh, lights. And so the UVB lights is the burning rays. And so you're never 100% uh, protected, but sunscreen is really your greatest protection of all. I encourage you to go get your uh, regular checkups. There's a lot of uh, a lot of spots that you'll miss because these can take place all throughout your body, and so you need to make sure that your doctor does a thorough checkup. And this is the other piece that I know that it's impossible for us to check on our neighbor, but I carry sunscreen with me everywhere I go, and my team will tell you, my kiddos will tell you, and everybody that knows me. I carry bottles, extra bottles in my handbags. Deb Davis is uh, agreeing because I think she has seen it. So has council member Arenas. Uh, I carry them with me. Uh, half of them are empty. Uh, I have three quarters of them, but everywhere. Uh, I throw them in David Gomez's uh, convertible car as he's driving out of the parking lot. <laughs> I, uh, but you know, our gardeners, our, uh, our custodian workers, people who are working out there, they sometimes don't have the luxury, nor do they know the dangers of being out there. Uh, you know, when I see coaches out there with our kiddos, when I see little ones who don't have sunscreen, I run to go get it out of my car. I, I carry it in the back seat of the car. I have it on every passenger uh, door, uh, door, as well as uh, in my glove compartment. I have at least ten different bottles in every um, every cabinet that can hold. Uh, I think it's just that important. By the way, also, this is a great preventative measure, measure when it comes to wrinkles and aging. So uh, it's an all around great thing. And so because of that, I want to declare May 4th as Melanoma Awareness Month and hope that you will join me in making sure that you take care of yourself. And as a result, I have left a little bottle in honor of my mother uh, for all of you because zinc is also the best form of protection versus sunscreen. And so 
if you look on your desk when you get a chance or you can have your staff there you go mayor so zinc is probably better than regular sunscreen as it stays on top of your skin instead of the sunscreen getting absorbed into your bloodstream and it works like having a shirt it stays on top and it reflects the sun rays from uh, entering your skin so please apply reapply there's no such thing as waterproof sweat proof or towel proof. So whenever you're in the water, whenever you're sweating, uh, make sure that you're reapplying and reapplying and reapplying. Don't forget your nose, the top of your ears and those knuckles. Uh, this is my mother and in honor of my mother, uh, I wanted to gift you a little uh, bottle of zinc. Thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. And thank you also another beautiful photo of her mother, uh, Mary Carrasco. Uh, with, with its bottle. Thank you so much, uh, Councilman Carrasco. Uh, all right, let's go to members of the public. Let me first ask, is there a motion on these items? Sorry, I made a motion, but I did not include everything. So I, I will include uh, all the items. Thank you. Thank you. And that's okay with the seconder? Yes. Uh, Mr. Beekman? Hi, I wanted to speak on the other consent calendar items. Is that okay? I'm... Please, please do. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm interested uh, in the final items of the consent. There's three items that were brought to Rules and Dublin Government last week. One of them includes uh, health statistics, new COVID statistic gathering practices. And um, it's, it's at the state level. Uh, it's a bill going through at the state level. Um, I don't know the depth and details of it. Uh, me and Chappie Jones had a bit of a falling out last week about the subject. I simply wanted to note that with new bills being introduced at the state level for, uh, you know, uh, the surveillance of COVID issues, you know, just simply remember, uh, you know, the good ideas of civil rights and civil protections and, and, and good practices of what those can be at this time. And, and that can really help guide this sort of process. It's an important process, I, I don't deny it at all, but to just simply, I just simply wanted to remind of the importance of uh, the civil rights and civil protections and how to balance those concerns with, with these new surveillance uh, ideas for COVID. Um, there is an item, to, I don't know, 2.3 or 2.4 that talks about um, uh, clean energy issues and pain, uh, uh, new fees, new legal fees to lawyers. I hope at this time I can talk about community energy and uh, these new lawyer fees uh, and, and community, community energy's part recently in, in new subsidy plans you've developed. Uh, it's my real hope that with these new subsidy plans that you consider renewable energy ideas and we're at 50% dirty fuel use uh, for clean energy in San Jose at this time, clean community energy work to do better. We can really, really do better in the next few years. Thank you. All right, I believe those are all the members of the public would like to speak. And forgive me, I misstated uh, Councilmember Cross's mom's name, Maria. Uh, thank you for your, for understanding, Councilmember. Okay, um, let's vote on the motion. Jimenez? Yes. Prowlis? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Jones? Aye. Lucardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're on to the report of the city manager on the regular agenda, item 3.1. This will be a lengthy presentation. Is that right, Dave? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Thanks for the opportunity. We do have a, an update on COVID uh, today. Um, wanted to start off with uh, recognizing some of our staff as, as we normally do. And so today we wanna recognize um, the EOC volunteer branch of, of our team. Um, the EOC branch has been supporting and coordinating and recruiting volunteers for vaccination events since January. Uh, to date, over 8,230 
the volunteers have been engaged overall. Uh, the team coordinates with the mayor's office and council offices and Sil Silicon Valley Strong and Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. Um, since January, they have signed up 1,230 volunteers through Silicon Valley Strong um, and have co coordinated almost 1,000 hours of vaccination site support with, with these volunteers. Uh, they also have supported um, vaccination canvassing events to notify our hardest hit communities about uh, vaccination events and opportunities in, in our neighborhoods. Um, and of course, I think we all recognize that uh, recovering from the pandemic really takes our entire community working together. And so really grateful to the team um, for their organizing work, um, supporting the volunteers uh, to ensure that our community gets vaccinated. Of course, uh, a huge amount of thanks to all of the volunteers as well for, for supporting our city. And so today we honor uh, Pablo Hockey, uh, Brandy Maldonado, uh, Aurelia Bailey, and Paul Myrie for their, their leadership in this work. So thank you, team. So next, we're going to jump into the uh, COVID update, and I'm going to ask uh, Kip to, to lead that effort. Thank you, Dave. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council and members of the public. I'm Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager, and along with Lee Wilcox, serve as the Director of the Emergency Operations Center, or our EOC. So today, we're going to provide a brief update on activities undertaken in April by the city's emergency operations center, an update on vaccination, excuse me, an update on vaccination support efforts, supporting our county's leadership and information on our approach to reopening of city facilities and the resumption of more in-person office work. So at a top level, globally, the pandemic continues to rage with almost 700,000 new cases and some 11,000 dying each day with both of these numbers likely to be significant undercounts, especially with many in rural areas in particular, uh, lacking access to tests, medical treatment, and often dying without being counted as part of this death toll. Access to vaccines continues to remain very limited in most countries in the world. Here in the United States, we appear to be nearing a positive tipping point with vaccinations increases, increasing and cases declining overall and with the outbreaks we saw in the upper Midwest appearing to subside. Here locally in Santa Clara County, some 2,068 people have died from COVID-19. We have 76 patients currently struggling with the disease in local hospitals, and the seven-day rolling average of new cases has declined to about 98. We remain in the orange tier overall. Our work in the Emergency Operations Center is guided by the city's roadmap shown here, which highlights in pink the 18 most important initiatives that we are undertaking in response to the pandemic. This slide provides a snapshot of the work of the EOC for the month of April, 2021. Our numerous branches continue to, to do work in support of our most vulnerable communities. You've already heard a bit about our volunteers and their partners during the Unsung Heroes, and you will receive a vaccination task force update shortly. Additionally, you'll receive extensive information from many of our branches during the study session later this evening. So I will highlight the one uh, branch, Beautify SJ, which we will not be covering in depth elsewhere. Our Beautify team worked tirelessly to bring biweekly trash services to over 100 encampments, resulting in over 600 trash pickups. And just from our most complex sites alone, some 420 tons of trash were removed. More tonnage was picked up from the other sites, but those are not tracked by tonnage. At the same time, the team supported eight interagency cleanups, which gives us access to property owned by other agencies or jurisdictions and to assist them in cleaning up their property. We also deployed our rapid team to remove some 400, excuse me, 247 tons of illegally dumped trash and debris. I'm grateful to all of the people and the teams in the Emergency Operations Center for their unrelenting work in service of those who have borne the burden of this pandemic. Now we're gonna take a deep dive into the work of the Vaccine Task Force, which was created in December to support the county's vaccination efforts. For this section, I will turn it over to Ann Tran, who is the director of our Vaccination Task Force to share the work of the team and what is coming next. Ann, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Kev. 
Good afternoon, Mayor, Council members, and members of the public. My name is Anne, and I lead our city's vaccination task force here in the EOC. I'm really excited to provide you with an update on our vaccination efforts. Um, back in January, I introduced our initial roadmap, which our goal was to ensure that at least 85% of San Jose residents are vaccinated by August 1st. And our objectives were to connect our community to vaccinations, advocate for equity, speed, and scale, and connect our employees to vaccinations. Next slide. Since then, we've made quite a bit of progress um, on this front. And even in the face of vaccine supply shortage um, for February and March, we've prioritized outreach to seniors 65 and older and have since um, expanded to other vulnerable populations such as the unhoused, those with disabilities, and even residents in um, highly impacted census tracts who are among the least vaccinated. We've advocated alongside our county and our partners to call upon the state and the federal government to ensure that equitable vaccine distribution means that more vaccine would be allocated to communities who are most at risk, most vulnerable, and who are first to be impacted by COVID-19 wouldn't be the last to receive the vaccine. And we ask that the state prioritize vaccinations based on census tract data, not just zip codes. And in addition to accounting for um, population size, but the state also considers the social vulnerability index and COVID-19 impact rates in its prioritization efforts. We've also worked to connect our uh, employees to vaccinations by way of the first responder clinic. And all while trying to find ways to expand community vaccination sites in the city of San Jose, while helping our, our partners and our county with outreach. Next slide. Within three months, the team has completed our first roadmap. Next slide. Now our main focus is to expand upon ways in which we can further connect our community to vaccinations so that we can reach that goal of 85% of San Jose residents vaccinated by August. Next slide. Keeping that focus on our most vulnerable, we must build vaccination capacity through equity, speed, and scale, as well as maximize education, engagement, and information dissemination so that we can expand access, confidence, and acceptance of vaccines to our community. Next slide. Our new roadmap will focus on vaccination operations, such as building capacity to put on more vaccine um, events in communities, as well as prioritize hiring more staff to support our county who is lead in this overall um, COVID-19 response effort, and as well as support our par partners and providers um, to augment the county's mobile vaccination efforts and continue our outreach efforts and provide injector support through the fire department where there is need. Next slide. We have a two-pronged approach to building capacity for community vaccinations. We want to build more partnerships with and collaborate with healthcare partners to bring even more vaccination events to hardest hit communities for our most vulnerable residents. Um, just within the last month, we've been able to collaborate with healthcare partners in a number of different ways. On April 10th, we collaborated with the San Andreas Regional Center, Silicon Valley Independent Living Center, Parents Helping Parents, and Healthier Kids Foundation to put on our first um, vaccination event with Safeway at the San Andreas Regional Center to administer 300 doses of vaccine to our residents with disabilities. We then tried um, to partner with Aki to um, put on a, a vaccination event using our Rotunda facility um, on April 16th. In partnership with Aki and Silicon Valley Independent Living Center, we were able to administer 540 doses of vaccine to those who are unhoused, unsafely housed, and those with disabilities. And the most um, exciting thing about this event is that we were also able to provide um, hot meals, 500 meals, and help our residents um, sign up for their stimulus checks. And 20 of the injectors that supported the event um, that day, eight of them were from our San Jose Fire Department. And then we tried to meet the communities right in their backyards. On April 18th, we partnered with Project Access and Safeway to put on a vaccination event um, at Foxdale Village Apartments. And we were able to administer 366 doses for this event and provide 300 meals. This is the only event in which we maxed out all of our um, vaccine supply for that day. Um, all events are accompanied um, with neighborhood flyering, targeted communications, and other outreach efforts. 
When we look at supporting the county, we want to provide our staff to support with county vaccination operations. Our San Jose Fire Department have supported the county with vaccine administration through the first responders clinic since January. This, this clinic um, has since transitioned to a public vaccination site last month. Currently, our fire department is also supporting with in-home vaccinations for very frail, vulnerable residents who can't easily leave their homes. As the county is scaling mobile vaccinations in neighborhoods, our city is supporting in targeted outreach and canvassing, as well as broad communications such as social media engagement and next door in which we have a larger presence than the county. Our fire department is also prepared to staff and support county mobile vaccination sites to add capacity um, where there is need. We are also supporting the county with scaling staffing capacity through hiring 200 multilingual employees, also known as vaccine champions, um, to support non-clinical operations at vaccination sites. So it takes about 15 city staff. The majority are from HR, um, OER, the library, public works, and the environmental services department to make this hiring and logistics team um, able to support this recruitment. To date, we've received over um, 1,000 applications and 300 of those applications are in the queue for screening and bilingual testing. We've reached, um, we've, six, we've over um, reached our commitment of 80% um, bilingual staff to the county. And as of Monday, we sent 50 vaccine champions to the county to support operations and we'll send more in batches in the coming weeks. Next slide. I wanna say a special thank you to our San Jose Fire Departments. Since January, 47 firefighters have supported the county's first responder clinic, and some are now deployed to support mobile vaccinations. 2,170 city employees were able to get vaccinated through this first responder clinic. Now the fire department is also carrying out in-home vaccinations. The county received 1,224 requests for in-home vaccinations. Of those, 905 residents met the federal Medicare definition for in-home or homebound, and that means 575 individuals have gotten vaccinated through this program to date. The current capacity for this program is 200 vaccinations per week, and this is being supported by different fire departments, including our own um, San Jose Fire Department. Another five firefighters um, will support this Saturday with Bay Area Community um, Health, on May 8th to deliver vaccinations to residents in the Cadillac and Winchester neighborhoods at Rosemary Elementary School. And then another eight will support Aki at the Rotunda once more for the second dose event that is happening on May 14th. Next slide. So the new challenge is access and acceptance, not supply. The county receives additional vaccines from the Health Resources and Services Administration, also known as HRSA, um, which is a federal um, program. Last week, the county received over 200,000 doses from HRSA, and this week, the county also received 62,880 Pfizer and Moderna doses from the state, with current capacity to administer 250,000 doses per week. The county is currently providing about 30,000 vaccinations a day, and the state is projected to receive about 1.7 million vaccines, including Johnson & Johnson doses. In other words, this means supply is exceeding vaccinations per day, and vaccinations per day are decreasing for the first time since they began, just starting a week after eligibility expanded to all residents um, 16 and older. About 70% of the county's population aged 16 and older have gotten at least one vaccine dose. For the city of San Jose, the number of first dose vaccinations for those 16 and over is 72%. The to a total of 43% um, of the county's population aged 16 and older have completed their vaccination. So that means either two full doses of Pfizer or Moderna um, vaccine or one Johnson & Johnson dose. The remaining 30% of the county's residents are un who are unvaccinated are dis disproportionately Latinx, low-income, young, and among San Jose residents are concentrated in the east side and near downtown. Due to differences in data collection regarding ethnicity, the number of vaccinated Hispanic residents was previously underreported by an estimate of 22,000 residents. Even with that correction, the Latinx vaccination rates are still at 46%, 
still the lowest compared to other demographics in our county. Next slide. So in order to reach the remaining unvaccinated residents, a targeted and strategic approach is required to break down existing barriers. Our overall strategy for vaccine messages is to increase early in May, assuming that's when the supply of doses would catch up with the demand for them. However, this timeline ended up being pushed up when the county received additional doses of vaccine in mid-April, and the city has resumed its phone bank and continued um, tar targeted flyer drop efforts to, to meet that um, demand, as well as push traffic um, to vaccination sites via targeted social posts and emails. And we've also leveraged local media in driving, lo uh, dri driving traffic to vaccine locations co-hosted by the city. A number of efforts are starting next week, including the next batch of direct mailer to targeted zip codes, geofenced digital ads to targeted zip codes, print and radio ads, and a whole social media influencer campaign. Materials are being produced in languages most spoken in target census tracts, primarily Spanish, English, and Vietnamese. Influencer partners are primarily Latinx, Vietnamese, Filipino, and Black community members who were not previous, previously connected to city communication channels. Our emphasis has been on digital content and direct mail because of the quick and cost-effective nature of reaching our target audiences. We are looking forward to sharing more information with the Council regarding each of these various tactics at our next update. However, in the next month, we will continue to support the County with, and our healthcare providers with neighborhood canvassing efforts in San Jose's 46 priority census tracts, as well as continue working with our healthcare providers in the county to put on more evening and weekend events um, to accommodate for working hours and schedules. And then we will also bolster our partnerships with CBOs and outreach and engagement to small businesses, faith-based organizations to ensure that we promote vaccination acceptance and confidence in our communities. Lastly, we will also try to find ways um, to do more engagement in community communications to our young adult population, as those between ages 18 and 29 make up the highest number of unvaccinated individuals in the county. Yet, although cases are flattening, um, individuals 18 to 34 um, account for the highest number of infection rates across any age group. Next slide. I want to talk a little bit about place-based vaccinations for our most vulnerable residents. There are about 46 census tracts with a score of nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 in the city. These areas are shown as red on the map. We call these census tracts priority impact areas and they may change over time, but because of the map highlights based on percentiles, we will always see the 20% of tracts with the highest need in terms of low vaccination rates, high COVID-19 positivity, coupled with social vulnerability and healthy places index on this map. The priority impact areas are concentrated in the following locations. On the east side in District 5, neighborhoods just east and south of downtown in District 3, Seven Trees in Edenvale in District 2 and 7 respectively, and more isolated areas in Alviso in District 4, Buena Vista and Burbank area in District 6, and the Cadillac and Winchester neighborhoods in District 1. The purple icons indicate vaccination, vaccination sites in which we were able to partner with healthcare providers to put on um, more vaccination events to, in communities. These sites are within the high priority areas identified on the map. We've also touched over 13,800 homes through our various flyering and canvassing efforts. In District 3, we've reached Alma, Luna, Horse, Man, 13th Street, Julian Street, and St. James and Oakland Road. Um, in our canvassing efforts. For District 5, it was the Hillview, Cassell, and Foxdale Apartments area. In District 6, it was the Winchester, Sherman Oaks, and Buena Vista area. And District 7, the Tropicana, Little Orchard, and Summerside. We've also canvassed Overfelt and Meadow Fair around Tully and Eastridge for District 8. And then in District 9 and 10, Branham, Southside, and the Marshall Cottle areas and the apartments um, around that area. So since the county was facing severe sh um, vaccine shortages in March, we couldn't make phone calls or book appointments through our phone bank for fear of adding more distrust and confusion to our community as we would have been driving demand for vaccine where there isn't enough supply to meet the need. However, as the vaccine situation is looking a lot better, we reinstated the phone bank on April 19th. To date, the team has made in total 6,249 calls. 
Our strategy moving forward is to couple canvassing and phone banking using um, political uh, data to track our impact and to drive um, people to place-based vaccination events, as well as ensure that we saturate outreach within a one to two mile radius of any vaccination event in that area. We are working to build capacity to scale staffing um, for canvassing and phone banking, as well as build efficiencies in the phone bank through procurement of predictive calling technology. Today, eight of our have been trained to access and secure registration appointments through the city's health link system or the county's health link system. However, since most of the vaccination events are um, walk ups, drop ins, and no appointments necessary, we are working to reprioritize the phone bank to help people arrange for lists or VTA um, or paratransit rides to help them get to vaccination sites. Next slide. We've participated in, in discussions um, with the Latinx community around increasing vaccination rates. Every Monday night, the city and the county joins other um, Latinx community stakeholders to discuss how we can better support the community, especially in recovery and COVID-19 support. Together, the community stakeholders put forth suggestions for how the city and the county can be able to help increase vaccinations in the Latinx community. In order to improve access and vaccine acceptance in our Latinx community, we must build trust and focus efforts locally and geographically and engage faith-based organizations. We must also expand Spanish language access to build CBO capacity, as well as increase the number of promotoras and other outreach workers who are going out there to educate and engage with our residents. In addition to building more partnerships with CBOs, we must also increase um, site access by advocating for more supply to, to, be, uh, to be diverted to the east side, as well as increase flexibility to expand site access for evening and weekend um, events to accommodate for working hours, as well as um, make the events more accessible by having paid May with our partners, including second dose events. Next slide. Looking ahead, we're also exploring ways to make our city parks and facilities available to expand community access to vaccinations, working with the county to operate in more neighbor neighborhoods that continue to have high COVID-19 positivity rates and low vaccination rates. This effort will also help us with getting more lead time to bolster outreach and education in our communities. Next slide. And going beyond just vaccinations, our partnerships has helped us provide meals outreach support, vaccination registration, sourcing volunteers, providing transportation, um, helping people sign up for stimulus checks, case management, toiletry bags, and even financial support. Um, and this is, all of, this is all in an effort of getting our res residents vaccinated and connected to services. And together we pave a better way towards recovery out of this pandemic through continuity of care. Next slide. Lastly, our external partners are just as important as the internal team that keeps vaccination efforts going every single day. The city, um, every department in the city has supported vaccination efforts in one way or another. And I am truly grateful and I feel very, very lucky to be part of this team and to be able to work with such kind, compassionate, patient and intelligent people whose efforts have collectively made it possible for a municipality with no healthcare um, services as a core service, be able to find a place and space to become a prominent stakeholder in and provider in de delivering vaccinations to communities that need it the most, all while building partnerships that will outlast this pandemic and lead us to a speedy recovery. So to our mighty team, thank you so much for letting me speak about your accomplishments and your efforts um, to get us here this, this far. And with that, I'll hand it over to Kelly Parmley. Wow. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Um, you, you say that all with a very composed and um, moderate face and that's so much to share. Um, I have an appreciation for a in a small way for all that you and your team have been doing by leading the 15 person or so uh, group of folks here who are hiring the, the vaccine champions to send to the county. So seeing all of that and hearing all of that all at one time was a lot to take in and um, so grateful to you and the team and the county and so many other partners because um, this work 
uh, in addition to everything else that's going on in our city and in our county, it's what allows us to have this conversation and open this conversation with, um, with the council and with the community today. So mayor, council, members of the community, um, thank you. I, I'm Kelly Parmley, the assistant director for human resources uh, as part of my day job. And then also have been running the Powered by People team, um, supporting the team who's hiring the vaccine champions and um, also a, a few other things. So. I know this conversation is one that's uh, of great importance to all of us. And I think uh, Dave in a conversation the other day reminded us that um, while we might all be exhausted and uh, tired over these last few months, we really should be excited about the prospect of being open, being able to open our city hall and our city facilities and, and finish some important work that we've already started in terms of opening city services. So sometimes it's a little hard to, to get the excitement going, but I do want to offer some promise today about um, where we're going and what we're proposing in terms of what we're calling uh, return to on-site work and reopening of city facilities. In order to do that, though, um, I do want to take you back in time a little bit uh, and cover some territory, some reminders that we had to do ourselves internally about where we were at the last time I spoke with you. Back in October uh, was the third of the third presentation that I had given about the work that we were doing to expand and reopen city services. So in October, we were in this particular stage, the orange tier, uh, which felt like for about a hot second that we were, you know, in this stage. And then very quickly went all the way back. Uh, by December, we were in stage five. Um, again, it, it was it was disheartening for many of us, but we also knew how important it was. Um, for our community and for ourselves and for the safety and health of everyone um, to make sure that we could undo everything that we had had done, um, not in terms of essential services, but certainly some of the things that were on the horizon. At that point in time, we were coming to you with some data, um, which I want to first remind you on the next slide that this was the framework under which we talked to you about some data about the status of city services and that far left box there is the safe workplace. And that team made up of facilities and safety were the ones who've been sort of guiding and enabling and supporting the process for um, expanding and reopening city services. And so we came to you in October on the next slide with a picture of uh, city services that we had never done before. And just to reorient you to this on the far left side are our services that we had gauged had been open since the beginning and continued those important things like water, uh, like our streets, like our um, sewers, everything that needed to be maintained from an essential city service perspective. And then um, essentially, we also shared with you in this particular slide um, that we still had a large number of vacancies and we're operating a pretty large EOC at that point in time. Um, and, and so the two I want to focus on on the next slide are that we had gotten to this bucket of what was continuing to need support in terms of expansion. Now that we were all excited, we were in the orange tier. And on the next slide, it'll show you a highlight of some of what those services looked like in terms of how the departments had gauged um, their status in terms of relative to pre-COVID, you know, where were we in terms of operations. So we had very few services at that point in time that were under 75%. Um, and then we had a very small number of services on the next slide that we had still been suspended. And on the next slide, um, we were getting ready and um, through great partners, uh, working with library and PRNS in particular to figure out how to expand services. And so I just wanna pause there for um, a second and, and say, you know, we, we were ready, we were on the cusp, we were talking with, about Happy Hollow Zoo and we had gotten to that place and lots of plans. The, these departments have never stopped throughout the pandemic to try to figure out how we were gonna get back to that place where we could have fully operational services. So on the next slide, um, to give you a sense of our current status, um, I need to take a pause here and say three things. Number one, enormous gratitude to our departments who continue to uh, meet our asks for data. Um, and with the support of Keith Lewis and Eric Jensen, who are the masters of data and data visualization, I'm able to share a few things with you, but our departments have been really responsive. Um, what we did here when, with respect to data was we organized it this time differently by budget program. We had kind of a weird look at it uh, before some sort of um, amalgam of how to, how to show services. Um, we also are showing uh, an EOC here that's about less than 300 at this point, somewhere between 250 and 300. Um, at the time, we uh, back in October, it was, it was well over 300, almost 400. 
and our vacancies are around almost 700 at this point. And back then they were around 680 or so. And, and so we wanna focus on is show you a little bit about where we're at with those that are in the not fully reopened that yellow bucket on the next page. Um, and, and show you that um, on the next slide, uh, again, another look at uh, those services that are not completely operational um, and require and continue to require some additional support in order for us to reopen. Now, mind you, we're all still in the orange tier and looking toward the yellow tier as our guidance uh, for how to reopen, but we're working actively at the moment on trying to figure out how within even the orange tier we can expand reopening. On the next slide, um, I think what's really important is we ask the departments to just give us a quick check mark about whether or not this requires bringing employees back into a city space. So you can see most of those services in order to get fully operational require us to think about getting employees back into a, a city space. And then on the next slide, uh, we also ask them what it require us in order to get them fully operational to bring the public back into a space. So we're on this threshold at the moment, uh, still in orange tier, still with social distancing and many of the safety protocols uh, of needing to think about how do we fully uh, get these operational. And, um, and I wanna give a quick shout out to our folks in PRNS, John Cicerelli, uh, uh, in the library with Jill Bourne and Chu Chang and PBCE, who've been incredibly responsive to us in terms of thinking about what can we do within the orange tier to move things along in terms of planning and still do it safely. So uh, on the next slide, I also want to share then that we're in a very, very, very small um, a set of services that are still suspended. And if you look on the next slide, those are cashiering and family camp, and we're well aware of the situation of both of those. And uh, Julia Cooper has been a, a great voice for us needing to figure out how to serve folks who are unbanked and needing cashiering services. Um, and, and so with respect to services, um, uh, you know, this data has been really helpful for us to figure out how to, um, how to prioritize as we are in this, what I would call liminal space. Uh, of the orange tier and trying to figure out uh, how we manage space considerations. And, and yet we also need to think about a second really important constituent here. Sorry, Kip, I didn't advance that one, but the next one also um, is, is our employees. Um, and this is a, another really important consideration. So we have services that we have to consider and we also have our employees to consider and nothing happens in the city without our employees. And so back in October, I shared with you that about 60% of our employees, uh, our full-time employees, this was based on, um, have been working in the field or in a city facility. And yeah, overnight, we pivoted about 40% to working remote. And at that point in time, had uh, about 680 vacancies and then almost 400 people still in the EOC. And, and so to get some feedback and some data from our employees about where they were at, this slide essentially says from a survey we did back in October, that about two thirds of employees who responded to the survey and were working remotely said that they were um, satisfied or highly satisfied with the, the technology, the resources and the equipment that they needed to work effectively and to also do that safely. On the next slide, our remote employees also told us that a large proportion, more than 50%, wanted to continue to work full time in their remote status and another almost 40% wanted some sort of hybrid situation. Um, and so lastly, on the last slide, for those city employees who were um, folks who were working in the field or in a city facility, we had asked them some feedback about um, safety precautions. And this is strong feedback that our safety and facilities teams were doing a really great job to make sure that people had the training, the equipment, um, and the appropriate direction in order to be in those places safely. And so in terms of listening to employees, I think that was important feedback as we considered and now are considering um, the most important thing and of interest to everyone here, which is on the next slide, um, what's gonna guide our work um, going forward? Uh, and what, our, what is our proposal about how to continue to do this safely? And at the same time, understand that our community wants uh, services as do all of you uh, to be fully operational. Um, and how do we prioritize those things at the same time? So on the next slide, um, with uh, a lot of conversation um, and some good framing work from, from Kip, who got us on a good foot here, um, the first two principles for us as we started a work group that cuts across uh, OER, HR, uh, IT facilities, 
um, is number one, our employee health and safety and well-being has to be at the center of what we do. And at the same time, um, we have to have the end in mind, which is the effective and efficient service delivery. And so how do we think about services first and at the same time balance the considerations around uh, employee health and safety? Um, the other thing is, the third one is so important, is that um, remote work is here to stay, uh, and many workplaces will be hybrid. But with that service delivery in mind, not everybody's going to be able to work remotely. And so how, under the most flexibility and yet being responsible with both city resources and employee safety, do we think about how to use office time, where office time does best and where home time might be serving us really well? Um, and then lastly, um, we have to continue. And as a person who's been deeply involved with our business process automation folks and partnering with IT so much, we have to continue to work on technology and process improvements. It doesn't serve everybody the same or everybody well. And we have to continue to focus on those who are not being served well in those processes, but to serve both our employees and our community, continuing to invest in technology and process improvements is going to be really important. So we hope to use those as, and, and hope that you will join us in using those five principles uh, as we consider how to um, resume on-site work and reopen city facilities. On the next slide, a couple of things that I think are super important. Clearly, uh, you heard from Anne and her team, and, and, and Kip has been really uh, strong in, in helping us understand that the vaccination, pro the vaccination progress is incredibly important and is serving us really well. Um, you know, I've been reminded of the la in the last week that our vaccines are really, really good. So as the general population reaches those thresholds that we're looking for, 85% uh, for us in the city and uh, I think the county's target is 75%, um, that means that we can do things uh, uh, potentially uh, if they relieve, relieve us of the social distancing and some other things, we can be more safe and space together. By June 1, um, we believe all of our employees who wanted to get vaccinated will be able to have been vaccinated. And so that gives us another sort of milestone. Um, and we also know that we need to continue safety protocols. So we're waiting to see what happens with social distancing, which is our greatest constraint on space, as you all know. Uh, if you've come to City Hall and you um, are around elevators and reminded of shared space in the lobbies there's and conference rooms and everything else, we are still constrained by space. Masking, however, will probably continue for some time. The other thing that's really important is I uh, have been watched this with everybody else for over the last year, we'll follow the county's lead uh, as we move to the yellow tier for sure. However, and we just have had three or four major conversations in the last few days around this is how can we prioritize with the insights from the departments about the most impacted services and communities and I've already had exchanges with PRNS, uh, with library, they've been phenomenal planning partners and able to, to tell us on a moment's notice what are the most impacted and then work with us on safety and then recently with PBCE. So we're going to uh, do as much as we can as fast as we can in the orange tier while we wait for the yellow, but it's not going to stop us from getting ready to expand and reopen. And then the other thing which um, the folks on the safety team and facilities team and everybody who's involved with space considerations as well as how we effectively deliver services will tell you it's not an on off switch. We've been working with the library we've been awesome partners for months and they will still tell you that tomorrow they can't just expand on open library branches. Um, they're ready to do it for sure, but it takes a bit to do it. So we'll accelerate where we can, but it's just not an on and off switch. On the next slide, um, there are some very specific considerations um, to returning to City Hall. Um, City Hall is not the only space as most of our employees will tell you, um, but for sure it's one that's um, deeply important to all of us, both symbolically, but also in terms of service delivery for some and for the home of, of many employees. So we're proposing, given what we know about vaccinations, um, that somewhere in early July, we can do a soft opening. We're gonna work closely with departments to vet proposals about who they want to return and how that might look, um, provide some feedback, but give maximum flexibility. And we're looking forward to the public somewhere in early August, again, depending on health guidance, but again, really strong planning going on and really good conversations with the first floor and all the way up to the fourth floor in particular. And then we've already started and have been engaged in conversations around council chambers and, and how do we do and prepare for a hybrid environment in early August. So these other considerations in terms of returning on site, uh, again, social distancing, I mentioned a few times, really constrains our space. 
um, when that's relieved and the vaccination thresholds have been met, um, we are in good, uh, good stead to be able to have folks in a space. Technology is so tricky and so important to what we want to do, uh, particularly in that hybrid environment. And so we, we really need to be careful about not overloading facilities and IT when it comes to how do we figure out a hybrid environment? Nobody has this figured out yet. Uh, and that's going to take some time to understand what works for our employees, like what's the best technology, how do we not do something too fast. And then lastly, uh, not unlike our uh, counterparts uh, in other agencies, um, we're working on as a work group making a recommendation for developing an overall city goal for a proportion of our workforce uh, to work remote. Um, Jennifer and I have had many conversations about how important we feel this is going to be to retention of, of employees and also attraction of the next generation, uh, leveraging what we've learned about what works from a remote perspective. Again, honoring the fact that services have to come first and how does service delivery need to happen and then asking considerations around what might happen remotely. So um, with that, Kip, um, that's what I have to offer up today if you want to bring us home. Thank you, Kelly, and, and thank you, Anne, and most importantly, the teams that you're all working with to make all of this possible. I, I think you both have said it very well. I'll just close there and hand it back to Dave Sykes, our city manager, for any concluding comments, and then we are willing and able to take any questions, feedback, um, and comments that the council and community may have. Yeah, thank you, Kip, and thank you, team. Really appreciate the work that went into this, and all the discussions we've been having. And so uh, I'll pass it back to the mayor and the council and look forward to their input and questions. Thank you, Kip and Kelly, everyone who's worked so hard. Uh, and thank you also, Dave, for the recognition, including our own uh, Paul Meyer in that recognition. We appreciate that. Uh, right, let's go to the public first, uh, Blair Beekman. Hi. Blair Beekman here. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this report. It was, excuse me, it was optimistic. And that was, that's nice. Uh, you know, I'm the last place guy, last in knowledge, uh, last in love, but, but first in hope. <laughs> I still have hope, I guess. So uh, thanks for this item. And, um, you know, I, just to give some background, uh, you know, it was my understanding that uh, the city of Fremont, they had to close their school year. They, they couldn't open it up more uh, back in early April because, you know, the COVID was so serious in, in India and in Southeast Asia. And um, among other factors, you know, they, they really played it conservatively and safe. And it was an interesting choice that I felt they made. Luckily, we're pulling out of it, it sounds like. I think we still have to consider what's going on in Southeast Asia and India at this time. Um, good luck how we do that. And um, yeah, I, I, boy, I just had the feeling that, um, uh, you know, we, if anything we can do to better promote and under, understand the vaccine process, I think can be of help. Moderna and Pfizer, they have a different system of vaccine than uh, Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca and uh, Sputnik. And I, you know, the, the, they have a homeopathic way to work, whereas uh, Moderna and Pfizer have a more uh, synthetic protein system. And we need to learn, I hope you can learn how to explain to the public that that can be a safe system to work in. You, you, you said it was a great system, but to really go into the explanation so we can feel safe and trust it, uh, it takes skill to do that. I hope we can all learn to do that. That should be our next stages. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Speakman. All right, uh, the person with the phone number ending 4963, welcome. Yeah, hi, Martha O'Connell. I hope the council will take into consideration, extremely serious consideration, that we are, on, we are not all equal in the situation that we're now in. Those folks who are autoimmune compromised, it may be extremely dangerous for them to come back, for example, into a council meeting. And there has got to be a hybrid approach where those folks are protected because I can't stress strongly enough, we are not all equal 
in staying safe. Thank you. All right, uh, coming back to council, I really want to thank Ann for her presentation in particular. A lot of hard work is being done by a lot of team members and uh, some new team members, I guess, since we're hiring folks for the resilience course is great. Um, and, and literally knocking on doors and, and getting out there. And I was out there myself with them. I understand it's, this is, you know, this is the hard work uh, that has to be done. My question is, I want to know to what extent we're leveraging others' uh, energy and time to help us in that hustling. And by that, I mean, particularly employers. Um, I think about some of the employers in our city who may employ a lot of residents who may come from the neighborhoods we want to target the most. Um, so maybe, you know, the Cardenas Me Rancho, the, I just saw the other day, Luna Kitchen has more than 200 employees. Uh, um, you know, even McDonald's. You know, I'd imagine that a lot of these employers would be quite willing to host vac smaller vaccination events on their campuses. And they could be very persuasive with their own employees and perhaps in persuading those employees to bring their families, bring grandma, you know, bring everybody. Uh, and, and they certainly have the incentive to want to make sure everybody gets vaccinated. How much are we talking to employers and are they helping? Um, that's a great question, Mayor. We're talking to anybody that is willing to host a site. We haven't heard much from the employers, but it's definitely an avenue that we're going to try to pursue in May now that the vaccine supply is more ample. So we'll, we'll make sure to provide you an update with um, how we're doing on that front. I mean, I, there was one, one company had who reached out to me, and I know Lee and I are talking to their team about trying to get something on their site. And although they may have employees that cover the gamut of incomes and demographics and so forth, undoubtedly there are people working on that site as there are other companies who clearly are, are sort of the, the, in the high priority, high risk communities. And so I can't help but think if we would put out a bit of a call to employers who wanted to help that we probably get some who would jump in and I'd certainly be happy to help with that. So I just throw that offer out there. If you think there are folks you'd like to reach out to who employ a lot of folks who may be able to need us to reach a larger universe, that's just a lot less effort. I'd be happy to, to do that. The other question I had is around churches and whether the goddesses or in specific churches are, have been really offering maybe to have events for their congregations. Again, this issue of trust is so hard and there's a lot of trust issues to overcome. And I can't imagine that anybody would be more effective in overcoming the hesitancy than, than the local minister or priest um, in, in just being able to uh, make people feel comfortable uh, as well as obviously they have an incentive wanting to ensure everybody's safe in their congregations if they are coming in. And so are, are we seeing much participation with churches or have we in invited that? Yes, so um, we support the county when they do vaccination events at Our Lady of Refuge and other Catholic churches. We support with canvassing and driving people out there. That's kind of one ways, uh, one of the ways in which we're engaging faith-based organizations. Um, for other, uh, you know, we, we were talking with Aki about um, involving more of the temple uh, in District 8 and other religious organizations. So that's definitely an avenue that we're pursuing. And I think it, the, I think the way that we've been able to match sites and hosts to providers is finding a date that works for them. And, you know, the supply um, is definitely more optimistic now. So we are able to put on more of those events as, as May rolls around. Well, if there are targets, uh, target organizations, churches, facilities, or whatever that we can help with, please reach out to us. Mayor, we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Your your audio is going in and out. I think we've been able to mostly hear you, but you may want to check on that or do a little bit of a reset, uh, since I know it's going to be a long meeting. Anyway, appreciate uh, all of the information and uh, please let us know if we can be helpful to you in reaching out to any of those organizations. 
employers and communities, whatever it might be, that, that I know all of us have relationships in the um, Thank you. Uh, and Kip, Ann, and Kelly, thank you for the presentation, particularly around the vaccinations. It, just on the news yesterday, I heard a kind of alarming report that even with the level of vaccinations we're getting now, the country may never reach the herd immunity that we're consider that is needed to go back to quote unquote normal, whatever that is. And that uh, further the, the spike in COVID positive testing and deaths in Oregon is quite alarming. They've uh, closed a, lo a lot of the counties have closed their restaurants again. And that's a real close neighbor and can easily spill over to us. So um, I do have a lot of questions around the vaccines, but how are you, what are you thinking or how are you thinking about the potential shutdown again it, with the, the spike in Oregon in particular, the variants and then the lack of ever being in uh, re achieving herd immunity? Uh, thank you, Councilmember Foley, for the tough questions. Um, they're, they're really good ones, and the ones that we've been worrying a lot about. The, the variants of concern are, are exactly what they're named, variants of concern, and they're concerned because they're they're either more highly infectious, they're more deadly, or they can evade immune response, or two out of or two or three of those things all at once. Um, so that's what we think we're seeing in, in Oregon and other places. That's what we saw in the surge in the upper Midwest, was driven primarily by the B117 variant originally out of Kent in the United Kingdom. Uh, and the variants in, in other places including India, that appear to be um, uh, also variants of concern. So, you know, we're definitely in, in that liminal state where, yes, things are getting better, but we're not at all out of the woods. So we are obviously holding in the orange tier. Um, we're not going to be loosening up anything until uh, we move into the yellow tier. And again, just as we were, frankly, in the fall, we need to be all of us prepared to walk backwards rapidly if we need to into a more restrictive environment. Um, on the question of herd immunity, that's a tricky one, and it means different things to different people. You know, there, there's the, the uh, ideal level of herd immunity is that there are so many people vaccinated or with a level of immunity that, that an outbreak is contained by itself, that, that it cannot spread. But even with a level less than that, you will dampen the level of transmission of the disease. And if you have good contact uh, uh, tracing and testing, you can contain an outbreak much, much more easily. And as well, with this particular disease, as you very well know, death is very linked to age. And so th to the extent that we have those 50 and older, but really 60 and older, mostly uh, closer to herd immunity level, we can tamp out uh, um, the, the death rates very significantly, even if the overall population never reaches herd immunity. So uh, I, I go back to the statement that I've, I've made internally several times. These vaccines are extremely effective. They are nearly 100% effective at preventing death and serious cases of the illness. So if you yourself are vaccinated, at some point, the level of risk that we are incurring is actually extremely low. Uh, I think we'd ideally like to be back to that herd immunity level, and we're going to certainly push hard for that in this county. But even in the absence of that, I believe that we are functionally going to be able to return to normal sooner rather than later. Uh, and the people who will be most at risk will be those who choose to not be vaccinated. And so there is, uh, that's unfortunate, but that will at least be a choice for the most part, except for those who have uh, medical issues, immune issues, and obviously religious issues that, that prevent them from being vaccinated. Thank you, Kip. And, uh, you know, being vaccinated and being around people, family members who are now vaccinated, the most wonderful and most motivating reason is, one, you're going to uh, help keep everybody alive and, or uh, from serious risk of illness, but also you can now hug and interact more with your family members and friends. And, uh, and that is just, after a year and a half of not being able to do that, to being able to do that in the last couple of weeks of, of my vaccination is just such a freeing and hopeful moment. So, um, so I'm wondering how we, I know getting vaccines out to all of our populations is really important and particularly those areas that Anne you referenced, but 
the one area that I wanted to ask you more questions about, uh, actually a couple of areas, is the 18 to 34 year old population is the highest risk of infection and they have the lowest, at least the 16 to not 34, but the 16 to whatever number, 25, whatever, of vaccination. So how can we reach that population? How do we, do we go to the high schools? Do we go to the colleges? How do we make sure that that population who doesn't think they're at risk for illness because they're young, uh, but they are transmitters, they need to be vaccinated as much as anyone else. So how do we reach them and what can we do to help you? I think that's an emerging area for us to explore. It's, it, it, this, it, it's one of the ones that we will we don't have prioritized at this point because we still have a lot of the highly vulnerable and highly impacted as our priority. And so to a certain extent, we're letting the county figure that out a little bit and we'll follow their lead on how to do that. I know that they started working in, in high schools. They've started working with youth community. They started getting the message out from one of the things that we've heard with not surprising is that young people would like to hear from young people, not, not uh, old people like me and, and, and people with degrees and expertise. So we're very supportive of that effort. And for right now, I think what we'll do is largely echo that work and then as we have the capacity uh, once we get through our very vulnerable populations we'll pivot to working and supporting the county's efforts on that but to your point it is the one that is the least uh, uh, uptake at this point and it is an important one because even as you say even if they don't uh, are less susceptible to the to death they are still transmitters and it is it is necessary to get that transmission rate down 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 and school districts while they haven't said it yet uh, when school starts again in full and with less of a hybrid model in the fall, they may require vaccinations. Yes, so, universities already are. So right. San Jose State and, and, and others are requiring that and many school districts are moving in that direction as they have with measles, mumps and rubella traditionally. So I would expect that we, they will go there. Um, it'll be an indiv individual choice uh, with school districts, but that can also be a good motivator um, and by that point, you know, we'll have the capacity as we do to do on-site vaccinations and, and, and be very proactive in that. I also expect by that point that many of the vaccines will be available to the very young set so that we'll be going down in age over the course of the next few months. Um, and the good news on this one is that the youngest of, of us all are the very least vulnerable to this in particular disease. So I expect by the time we're back in school next year that that will be something that will be very uh, much available and the county will be leading a lot of those efforts. Great, thank you. Uh, one more question about the vaccines. The, the April 16th uh, vaccination at the Rotunda seemed very successful, uh, but it was uh, Moderna, I think, which is a two shot dose and you had a marginal, margin, well, you have a population that how are you going to reach them for the second dose? The unhoused population in particular, are you? How are you tracking that? Thank you, Council Member Foley. Um, the same way that we've been able to get them to the rotunda, we've relied on um, our, our housing department, the county's Valley um, Homeless Health Plan and Office of the Supportive Housing and other homeless advocates to help us um, get the word out for them to kind of come over to the rotunda. And we plan on using the same tactics to engage them one more time next Friday for their second dose event. So we'll keep you posted on um, how well um, those tactics work. Good, that, so that date's coming up next Friday. Okay, good, good luck. Please keep us posted. Um, and uh, just two more, uh, two more questions uh, regarding the, maybe three, the phone banking. How are you, um, one of my friends actually got a phone call from the, the phone banking and asking her about when she was getting vaccinated, which she had long been, but how are you targeting, uh, it, it, you'd mentioned zip codes, but, uh, there must be other lists that we're looking at, given where my friend lives, in relation to the zip codes. Early on, when she lives next door. <laughs> well, early on, when we were uh, scaling our phone banking, we went through this uh, the PRNS um, Active Net Listserv through Senior Nutrition Services. Okay. And PRNS, and that's kind of how we've um, gone through seniors 65 and older. Now that um, vaccines are more readily available, we're using the phone bank to help um, saturate communications around um, vaccination events. And we use that by uh, looking at PDI data. So we bought PDI 
uh, voter roll data so that we can generate call lists. And then we'll match that up with our canvassing efforts and then also broad communication. So that's kind of how we envision the phone bank rolling out in the future. And then there's also opportunities for us to match um, the residents with transportation um, support. So either get a chance. or VTA or paratransit would be uh, put it on the airplane the phone banking. That, that's great. And are we, uh, our script for phone banking, uh, is it a uh, screen for privacy and sensitivity to issues of the caller, just to make sure that we're not violating any privacy action act or uh, giving them advice where we wouldn't want to be giving them advice? That's a great question. Our current um, script right now is just simply call, inform, and refer just around vaccination sites and vaccination availability. Um, our phone bankers aren't necessarily um, booking appointments now that there isn't that much of a need for them to do so. Although previously, um, because we were able to get access to the county's um, vaccination portal, we were able to support with um, making appointments, but we don't keep um, any of those information and we, we kind of um, make sure that anything that the phone bankers take down, we keep it secure. Great, thank you. I, I appreciate that and I appreciate all you're doing on the vaccinations, that's really important. Kelly, I have one question for you about uh, getting back to work and it really has to do, because I know we're gonna talk about this a lot more later, but I wanted to ask, uh, because you had set a soft roll out with the public, what about national night out? People are get, beginning ready, getting ready to plan their national night out. It's the first week in August. We break for July, so we're already getting the questions. What's, what do you see is gonna happen there? And um, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, I don't and you have, have an answer. I don't have a crystal ball and I don't have an answer. Uh, I'm looking to Kip to see if his crystal ball or his magic eight ball is saying anything better. Well, good news is they're typically outside. So that we already know that we can gather outside and we already know how to do that pretty well. So I, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, uh, that's a very good catch council member fold. Um, and I can see by some of the colleagues reaction, that's something that's uh, obviously of interest to many council members um, as well as many leaders in our community. So we're gonna take that as an action item. Um, we're going to think about what we can do to support National Night Out this time around. Um, and I, I think we've got enough of a lead time to be able to not scramble on that. So thank you for the question several months in advance. <laughs> yes, we will. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. That concludes my questions. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I assume that was me. Sorry, Mayor, we can't hear you, but pre pretty sure I was next. I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in while you figure that out. Um, pl plus one to National Night Out. Great, great uh, note, Council Member Foley. I'm, I'm hoping, sure hoping we can do that. Um, and thanks for the, the great update. Really excited to see all, all the information and, and all of the city's efforts. Really inspiring. Um, wanted to just touch on a couple of related topics. One is that um, last night, in anticipation of this report, I spent a little time on the county website going through some of the dashboards, and and then happened to see a Merck article this morning that confirmed what it it looked like I was seeing in the data, which is declining demand despite supply increasing. And so it's a really interesting moment. You know, we're still quite a ways off from our 85 percent. There's a ton of supply. And, and what I read in the Merck article, at least, is that the large vaccination sites are, are not at capacity. They could, they could do a lot more, which is you know, good to have the capacity now, but, but unfortunate that the demand isn't as high as, as we'd like it to be. So it seems to me, if I understand correctly, that the hypothesis here, I think, is that the high-touch, high highly targeted, culturally confident, like really meeting people where they are, literally and figuratively, is the way to get to our goal. And I guess what I'm wondering is, how do, we, how do we measure the success of that hypothesis? And you mentioned that in a month we may, it's a hypothesis I fully believe in, by the way, but I think it would still be good, especially as we break down different tactics to understand, well, what's, what's working? You know, for, for an hour of volunteer time or a dollar of public investment or private investment, how many vaccines do we do we get? And so is that is that kind of along the lines of where you'll be going in your update in a month, or or is there a different way we should be thinking about that? 
Thank you so much, Council Member Mahan. That's a great question. I think. I think our goal is to couple um, vaccinations with more um, wraparound resources so that we go beyond just vaccinating individuals. We give them more support, even through food or stimulus check signups or even healthcare services like a mobile clinic where people can go in and get um, a doctor's visit. I think those are kind of incentives in which we are gonna try to get more people to turn out. And you are right. Um, you Across the board, I think the council members are kind of used to getting midday. Uh, please push this out to your communities. Please, um, you know, drive more people to these to these vaccination events. It's because um, we're experiencing a drop off um, in demand for for these vaccinations. And I think one way in which we can um, try to do more outreach in hard to reach neighborhoods is to do what we did with Project Access is just get them like be right there in their backyards, um, bring food, bring more resources. And what I learned from that experience, especially in D5 was that in the morning we had um, just, I think a normal amount of turnout, not that many um, people showed up. And then by the midday mark, when um, the ones that got vaccinated were able to reach out to their friends and families, we saw families of eight come out, 10 come out, and they were all getting vaccinated. And I think that word of mouth is very, very powerful. And that's kind of what we're going to try to do, especially when we're using our facilities, our city libraries, trusted sites like our parks, um, to put on these events is to get into people's backyards. And if I could, just in terms of sort of thinking about the measurement and and the uh, effectiveness of our work, you know, what the, the team went through a road mapping exercise and, ad and identified a, a, a set of initiatives in four categories for the next set of, of roadmap work. And what we're going to be able to do, uh, not quite with the precision that you might want, sir, but what we're going to be able to do is is have an understanding of what the uptake was and what part of what our measure is, is doses available versus doses that get used. So if we have an event that has 500 doses, were we able to get all of those used? And to what extent were we getting near or close to the, the, the community that we were targeting in terms of that usage? So we'll be able to do that event by event. We also have a better understanding now of the level of effort that we're putting into each event in terms of staff time, preparation time at the event itself, and, and well as the canvassing and phone banking. And so what we've asked the staff to do is as they begin to do those events to do kind of an action reflection model where they take a time to reflect on what worked, what didn't, what will we do differently. Um, and so with the, that data uh, uh, guiding them, how successful were we in hitting the targets and getting the people that, that we were hoping to get and how much effort did we have to put into it to get there. So uh, again, it might be a little less precise than, than, than we might do in a tech startup, but we will be using that same approach uh, around these, uh, especially the events where we have a very good way of measuring the, the amount of effort that we've put into the canvassing and phone banking side and the outcome of whether people got shots in arms. Great, Th thank you both. Yeah, that, that sounds really good. And, and so in a month when, when you all report out on the efficacy of, of some of these tactics that we're employing, um, what do you anticipate being able to report back in, in terms of efficacy? Well, I think we'll see at this point, I've got to say, um, uh, just to be honest, we've, we've just put this roadmap and strategy in place. We're, we're gearing up and hiring the team. So what I, what I hope to be able to do is to have the team use that data in real time as they do the events. And so we'll, we'll, we'll report up both that finding and also try to see what the, the patterns are overall. So I don't want to uh, uh, overcommit on the, the team in terms of measures until I've had a chance to sync with them. But our intent is really to, to give you a bit of a readout at a month time on, on where we are, where we are with efficacy, on, especially on the events that we've been uh, co-hosting with the county. Great. And Council Member Mahan, I would also like to point out that, you know, we're not the only um, service providers in vaccines, right? People are getting them from their local pharmacies, their doctor's um, office, the county, and other healthcare providers. So the way that we've been able to we do it broadly with social media um, and things like that, and it's it's harder to track in in that sense. So I think our I think the bottom line to our overall measurement of success would be how much closer we are able now that we're you know seventy two percent vaccinated in the city of San Jose. The next month, the measurement would be how much closer we are able to get to eighty five percent. I'm I'm glad you said that. So thanks, Anne. That that actually segues to my next question, which is that I I love the map and I think prioritizing, and if, I was, if I'm correct, it was census tracts, the 
that have the lowest vaccination rates. Are, are we able to see in, in future reports the citywide map with the vaccination rate, the actual percentage by census tract? Is that, is that available to us? And can we also see where we are investing in some of these tactics and whether or not we're moving the needle? I think it would be nice to actually get that visualization of where are we today? Where are we next week, next month? How is it changing based on our investments? I'm so glad you asked that question, Council Member Mahan. Our team is working hard on um, building a dashboard that will provide updates to um, kind of the phone bank efforts or canvassing efforts as well as um, the city's overall vaccination rates. And those would be broken down by council districts as well. Great. Okay. Excellent. Look, looking forward to that. I mean, I think it is great. And, and as we innovate here, we can we can share with others. I mean, we're not the only city that's having these challenges. And, and so I, I just, I think learning as we do this is, is important because we can we can help so many other other cities that, that may not have the same kind of data capabilities that we have. So um, great. Well, I'm really looking forward to learning more and, uh, you know, appreciate the direction we're going in and, and the great report. So thank you all. And, and thank you for creating a dashboard, the path that Councilmember Mahan's heart, I know. And <laughs> it's going to be great for the community, too. Uh, okay, Councilmember Arenas. Thank you. Um, so as we prepare to, to return to work, I, I don't want us to forget that there's a lot of parents, including myself, that will now encounter um, just some very strange um uh schedules with school my son currently goes uh 8 30 to 11 40 on certain days of the week um so I only I, and and i think the only the the folks that have very flexible schedules or that can make their own schedules are are kind of allowing their children to go back to school and so that i think um I hope we can see more children back in school at the end of the year. I, I fear that our, our children of um, essential service workers will not be able to do that. They'll, they just don't have the luxury. So um, please please continue to keep that in mind. And, and I'll say that um, also for our, our council colleagues as some of us are parents. And even if we aren't parents, we might be caregivers to folks in our lives um, that take that kind of, um, that we take that kind of responsibility. So I'm, I'm gonna move into this area of, in terms of why is it that um, some of our Latino community or that, that, that 56 is still um, percent in terms of vaccinations is still, there's a huge difference between some of those folks and other ethnic groups that are much higher. And, um, I think we've spoken about this in the past, Kip, in terms of what is it that we can do um, to really address uh, some of the concerns of, of our community. Um, I see, I saw that, and I don't know who presented it, maybe, maybe it was Kelly, and I think you were really appreciative of the folks who were your, the stakeholders around the table. And I saw a lot of folks who, who are really um, good representatives of the Latino community, um, the quick glance that I got on that. Um, and I just think that we need to make sure that we have a very hyper-focused approach to them. Um, I, I think the mayor, in, in, he was auto-tuning in his public comments, but I think what I captured in that was that, you know, we have to really respond to where um, our community is. And, and I'll tell you, I was reading um, this article from the Association of uh, um, American Medical Colleges, and it was this Dr. Fernandez from UCSF, and she talked about uh, the the just the the extreme distrust of the healthcare system for Latino uh, community, and it's and it's uh, partly because of the past abuse. And, and current uh, abuses, um, because Medi-Cal sometimes is very limited for Latinos. And if you have Medi-Cal, but you can't use it anywhere, it's essentially useless, right? And, and then I'm gonna point to uh, um, a, a real a, a terrible abuse of our children. And this happened in Florida by a principal um, who paddled a six-year-old the first week back um, in-person learning because that child caused a $50 
um, damage to a computer. And if you see that video, I, I call it a hate crime. And the, and the fact that our children can continue to be physically abused by people in, in the forms of authority. And, and we, know, we know that research has shown previously that corporal punishment, one, is ineffective, and two, um, if used within institutions, it's always going to fall on, heavy on, on, on children and people of color. Thus our prisons. Um, this is this week. This is not a developing country. This is this country on the opposite end. But I'm sure that in any other state that has corporal punishment and that is allowed, this is also continuing to happen. So, you know, we, we usually have a caller, and this is Mr. Soto, who talks about his own experience of, of physical abuse in the school systems, in systems, in institutions. And so I, I really want to bring that to the forefront. I don't want us to ignore it. I really want us to address it because it is, it is real. It, it is as real as it can get. I grew up with, with immigrant parents and they were you know, citizens by the time that I was um, older uh, in high school, yet you, you would think that they were undocumented in the way that they reacted with um, and careful with, um, at that time it wasn't called, ice um and and uh, there's just a very huge fear base and and two two of the areas that the doctor um outlined was one medical past abuse i'm, I'm now i've included my uh the abuse that i've seen in this in this school institution um by this hardly i would call an educator um and then second um and in the immigration system, even though we've, you know, people have said in the past, you will not be um, screened, you won't be asked for IDs. In this county, I have received, and I've said this to you, Kip, that people have been asking for IDs and proof of employment when, when uh, before April 15th. So, so, you know, there's a real fear of immigration. There's a real fear of, of the healthcare system. And I think it's time that we really take a look at what some of those strategies need to be for our community. We just don't have the time. Our, our community has, is dying, has died, is, is in pain. Um, and I, I just, you know, this is the same probably message that I, shared at one point or another last year. So some of the things that, that this doctor had recommended was, and, and this is something that I haven't actually expressed, um, but some Latino-based, you know, she talked about community clinics and things of that sort. I know that we're doing that and the county is doing that, but I thought also about uh, um, Latino-based pharmacies. And so these are, sometimes they're pharmacies that, that are, um, uh, herbal-based medicine, not necessarily um, where you fill a prescription, um, but they they lend a lot of trust um, from that community. Um, I grew up on a, a lot of a lot of home remedies that actually had a uh, when I looked them up have had a lot of um, a proof in them in in terms of addressing the illness behind that. Um, and so I think we need to acknowledge where our families are going, where Latinos are going. One, uh, and I think I heard the mayor say the churches, we, we re really need to get into the churches. I've seen just a couple so far. Um, and then the other pieces, we need to have them in the evening. I, I think I just came across one event so far that has um, ended at 7 p.m. Um, we can't expect families who are essential service workers to take the day off. I've talked to, you know, I, I, I'm in my community and I talk to the folks I've gone to, I, I go to Eastridge and I talk to essential service workers there and I go to Food Max and I talk to the essential service workers there and they can't afford to take an additional day off. If they're turned away, they just can't. They really can't. And, and you know, my office has also, um, and this I'll, I'll tell you offline, but they've encountered some issues in terms of um, securing an appointment with, uh, with a device. And so we have to do it for them over, over the phone. 
So going back to some of the strategies that the doctor defined, and these are um, social marketing campaigns. Um, and then, of course, Spanish language media, and I've talked about this before, and there are some very influential um, uh, morning shows that, that I don't know why we haven't utilized. This, this is probably a, a stronger messenger than maybe the church, the Catholic church among, among Latinos. Um, so social marketing campaigns, Spanish language media, um, of course, that was all place-based, and and you know one of the prim primary concerns is is that of missing work. So um, one of the things that I wanted to add to some of the suggestions that I've already expressed and reiterated now is also the consumer data information that we can obtain and we can purchase through PDI. Um, now this will allow us to include. Um, folks who are undocumented um, and who are not eligible to vote. So it's just not voters, right? These are folks who might have purchased an item um, with their email or their phone number and sound, you know, market or sell that in, um, information and we can purchase it. And so what I'd like to see is some of these place-based events that we are promoting have maybe some of the text, um, some texting uh, to some of those zip codes. I know we can't do it for everyone, but all of these are very specific um, events. And so I wonder if that's some, those uh, things, um, where are we at with the social marketing campaigns, the Spanish language media, maybe adding the consumer data. Yes, thank you for all of those. Uh, we are going to be rolling out a lot more Spanish language uh, uh, in, in both radio and, t and television work and uh, advertisements and also interactions. Um, and a lot of the points that you made are, are in line with the, the strategy we've developed partly out of your prior feedback. Um, I will uh, ask the team to include the, the broader PDI data. We talked about broadening that. We, we don't want to make sure it's not just the voter rolls. And you've had a, a chance to deeper dive deeper into the strategy. Any points that you'd like to add in terms of the, the very good points that the council member raised? Okay. Thank you, council member Reynas. Um, in talking about PDI, we do have access to some of that data now. I think we just finalized our purchase just last week. So that's one of the things that we're um, going to try to use and kind of scale with our phone bank and our canvassing efforts is to contact uh, people through the, the information that we've gathered, both voter roll information and those that, that are provided by PDI. Um, in terms of rolling out more Spanish um, media and radio, those are all the things that our EPIO is planning to roll out for the month of May, as well as a whole entire um, social media campaign listing um, and identifying Latinx community leaders and making um, promotional videos so that we can couple that with our um, flyers as well. And I think we, we can also do talk shows in Spanish language. Uh, it's a great strategy. Uh, the county's doing them already somewhat, but there's no harm in us adding on, especially now that thanks to Anne and her team, we're, we're in really good coordination with the county on sites and strategy. So I think that's a great add and we'll, we'll add that into the strategy in, in particular. I appreciate that, you know, and I, I, really my frustration is is because our our Latino community is maybe uh, somewhat in a in a different place, um, but um, in terms of vaccination and and that has increased and and that's all wonderful, um, but there's some real um, concerns ingrained into our community that we must address, and and we have to recognize that that there's things that that our community hears. Um, about especially like this child being paddled, um, held down by another, paddled by a principal, and the mom was so afraid because she was undocumented. I, I can you imagine how, what our undocumented community is going through in terms of vaccinations? This is a point where maybe they can be followed home, and so you know when you're in fear, you just don't think rationally. And so we, we have to really integrate all of this ASAP. I, I really hope that in the next update that I'm not um, once again reiterating, reiterating any of these points that I've already made. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Perales? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you, staff, as well, for the presentation. 
a lot of uh, really good information that um, I think would also be beneficial to our community to be able to hear. And I uh, wanted to actually ask that question uh, first in regards to uh, potentially a shorter version um, that may be available of the presentation specifically on the portion of returning to on-site work or reopening of city facilities. Um, there, even in that you know, section of it, there, there's quite a bit of slides there. Uh, but I wanted to see what the, the possibilities were for having um, a shortened version that, that really focuses on that aspect. That's something that we, we get a lot of questions about, I imagine my colleagues too. And uh, I'd love to be able to, to share that information um, and, and potentially even with a, with a synopsis of sorts. Uh, what is the possibility of getting something like that to uh, all the council members so we can, we can also share that? 100% possibility. That's a great suggestion and something that I think that every department head and every everybody in the city would appreciate. So we'll we'll come up with a, a crisper uh, version of that, uh, try to de-jargon it a little bit and also provide some overarching uh, kind of context, but but to do that in a crisp way. So I, I think that's a, it's a great suggestion and we'll just take that as a yes. Um, okay, great. Yeah, th thank you very much, Kip. Uh, any timeline you think something like that could be completed? I'll, I'll let the person who's also hired 400 people uh, answer that one. Um, uh, but uh, I think I think we can actually do that pretty quickly because it's a matter of shortening and making crisper what we've got and also putting down um, most of what you heard we have in note form already. So as long as we don't make the perfect the enemy of the good, I think we can get something like that out sooner rather than later. I would think perhaps within, Kelly, I'll, I'm gonna stop before I say something wrong. Uh, Kelly? Hi, um, thinking today is Tuesday. Uh, uh, how would you react to early next week, Roll? That's fine. I, I mean, I, you know, I think the alternative was I was looking at this and looking at how uh, I myself or my team would try to shrink something down. But then yeah. the thought yeah. that I had was rather than do that, uh, I imagine all my colleagues would, you know, appreciate this as well. So maybe we can just. I think all the info, as Kip said, it's there. It's just yeah. there's a lot, right, in regards to the presentation that's attached today. And so if we simply directed people to that presentation, it, you can get sure. lost. So. I think uh, I think shortening is probably really important, and I think Kip's point about getting some jargon out of there is also probably really important. So, Council Member Perales, I'll see what I can. I'll check in with somebody tomorrow, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. If we can get something to you by Friday, we we certainly will do that. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, and, and early next week works uh, as well. We can uh, be able to to uh, share it at that point. And then, in regards to the vaccination, just wanted to say. Uh, I have seen firsthand, actually in my neighborhood, uh, my house has been canvassed um, and they came and checked um, uh, on, on my, my family and I in regards to um, you know, whether or not we'd been vaccinated and uh, saw them obviously going through the neighborhood. And uh, in having that in-person connection, I know especially in these hardest uh, hit neighborhoods is really, really important. Um, and, you know, seeing that firsthand and I, I, you know, I obviously thanked the canvasser and appreciated them for the work that they're doing, uh, but just wanted to say thank you as well. I know that, that um, city staff and then on the county end as well, there's been a lot of efforts in this regard and, and that focus is that focus uh, is really meaningful. So just uh, appreciate that. And thanks again for, for the update. Thank you. Councilmember Carrasco. Hi, thank you. Um, just a, a couple of uh, a quick, uh, um, I guess, comments that I just wanted to follow up on uh, a few things that uh, actually Councilmember Adenas brought up. You know, I, I wanted to ask uh, Anne or, or Kip if you could uh, just clarify for me when when the sites, by the way, and Anne, I want to thank Anne for partnering with our office on the on the on-site vaccination event that we had at Foxdale, <coughs> we managed to, to to vaccinate 366 folks, and we'll be doing the second dose this Sunday. <clears throat> it's a uh, you know it, it's going to be a challenge because, and so I just want to preface that by 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 saying that it's going to be a challenge because it's Mother's Day, <clears throat> and so we need to get these folks out there for their second vaccine and let them know that this is a great way to get mom um, uh, taken care of and, and, uh, and to celebrate Mother's Day in a way that we haven't done so, which is by hopefully reopening up um, 
the economy and getting back to what what pre-COVID was. Anyway, so uh, so we have a couple of um, Mother's Day surprises lined up on behalf of our office uh, if they come out and get their vaccine. So just wanted to to say that. So uh, what I wanted to ask though the vaccination uh, task force is. Uh, in terms of the the vaccination sites and the events that are out there, <laughs> as Councilmember Arenas pointed out, you know a lot of our folks they're working uh, class individuals. These are people that can't necessarily take the day off. Uh, they can't rearrange their schedule. They're not zooming and they don't have direct deposit. You know, et cetera, et cetera. So when we set the schedules up, do we have control over those schedules? Or are we behold are we beholden to the county? Um, it depends. If you know the the way that we've been able to set the date um, at our Foxdale uh, Village apartments vaccination was that we were able to set the schedule because we partnered with um, a different provider other than the county. For the county led vaccination sites, if um, it is on our parks or our facilities, we have more influence on when um, the vaccination schedules would roll out as opposed to another um, provider. So I think it just depends on who our partner is. Um, and we'll definitely, I think the county and the city have a common goal to expand um, more evening clinics as well as weekend clinics moving forward. Okay, because I know that there's one that's taking place in my district right now at Rainbow Park, my, my, uh, my team, is out there in full force uh, with all of you. They've been out there this week, you know, canvassing the neighborhood. <clears throat> and that one is from one to seven. Um, and uh, and I don't know if you have the stats there. I don't know if you have your schedule there, but how many other uh, sites have we had that that is uh, later hours like this one from one to seven? I have to check with the county on the total number of evening clinics, uh, Mayor Cross or Council Member Carrasco. So let me get back to you with um, evening and weekend clinic schedule once I coordinate with the county. Okay, uh, that would be great to to see because I haven't, like my like Council Member Arenas, uh, I haven't seen uh, other later schedules. Um, I mean, I was just happy and rejoicing when I saw the 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 weekend ones, and uh, and there's there's a site now at Our Lady of Guadalupe, which, by the way, it's it's a it's very clever, and it's incredibly intelligent to be able to do a vaccination site at a Catholic church. And let me tell you why on so many, uh, it's, uh, it's very intelligent on so many uh, levels. One, because we heard very early on that it was, you know, that it went against, you know, the will of God for, you know, because of fetal tissue. And there's a lot of miscommunication and, uh, and we had to really work through that misinformation. So being able to have it there at the church sends a very strong message to the community. So that's one. Second is Our Lady of Guadalupe has been an iconic place in terms of social justice issues, in terms of really leading the community. Uh, it was the home of Cesar, Cesar Chavez and it's you know where Kennedy made a stop during his presidential run. Uh, I mean, just for so many reasons, it is a, a very ideal place, but also it's the largest Latino Catholic congregation, not just in San Jose, in the entire region. So it's ideal, but I, but I wanna tell you what's not ideal. It's uh, I think on a Wednesday or a Tuesday, and it is from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. So what's wrong with that? That is the time when our people are working. And no one is going to take the time off to go either find someone to take care of their kiddos who are in school or take the time off from work. They're just not going to do it. And especially if they have to stand in line uh, in order to just be told that they are not going to get a vaccine. Now, fortunately, right now, that's not the case uh, because there's plenty of vaccines available. 
But just a few weeks ago, that wasn't the case, right? People were being turned away. Uh, so you'd stand in line several hours it, it, and, and you'd have nothing to show for it. And so, so let me tell you about my experience just a few, a few weeks ago. I went and stood in line for three and a half hours at Overfelt High School. And they told me, you know what? You don't need to get there until about eight o'clock. They don't start until, I don't know, nine or 10 or whatever it is. I got there, I think it was at six. It was freezing cold. Um, I just didn't go prepared. I didn't take my little chair like everybody else did. <laughs> you know, I didn't take layers. I didn't take a scarf. I forgot my gloves. I had no idea it was gonna be this cold. I was freezing. <clears throat> And I was there for three and a half hours before someone came out to tell me that there was no vaccine, that I, I wasn't going to get the vaccine. And so the people in front of me and the people behind me had been there the day before and they were turned away. So now they were turned away a second time. And so I'm just going to give some feedback for whomever is listening. You should never turn anybody away with empty hands. Whoever is there should leave with something in their hands. A wristband should have always a wristband should always be given to the person that's there, even if it's not for that day. It should be given to them for the following day. Here, here's a wristband. Thank you so much for showing up. I'm so sorry you don't get it today, but you're you're guaranteed a spot if you come back tomorrow. Here you go. We should never ask our guests to come back to our home without giving them a taco. You know, that's just the culturally appropriate thing to do in any culture, whether it's, you know, if it's a Latino culture, you give them a taco. If it's a Vietnamese culture, I'm sure you're giving them something. If it's a white culture, you're giving them something as well. I mean, I don't care where you are. It's just hospitality. It's common hospitality and common courtesy. But to ask them to come still a third day with the potential of having nothing to show for it, why would people come back? And so here's the last thing I want to add. If you're asking people to come back and risk still yet again of not having anything, remember, these are individuals who have to either ask for time off or child care. We're really, we're really putting a strain on their household. So we have to start thinking what we're asking them to do and how we're burdening their lives. And so it's no wonder that people have been turned off by the very obstacles that we set up. So that, so I want to be able to say that. So the last thing is, I, I want to see at the next, uh, at the next um, update, I want to see how many, not after today, but up, up to today, I want to see how many sites we've had that are uh, 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 sites off the beaten track, meaning sites that are right in people's backyards like Foxdale, I want to see how many are outside of our own comfort zone, meaning outside of normal, regular hours, not for our convenience, but for the convenience of the community. So one to seven or three to eight or nine o'clock so that we are accommodating those individuals who are working and trying desperately not to go over that that cliff once all of the safety net are lifted and here's the last thing when I went and I stood in that line by the way for three and a half hours <clears throat> the I thought I was there early I was so late there were there were already three or four hundred people in front of me that's why I didn't get the vaccine that day so if I were there at 6.30 in the morning and there was already three or 400 people in front of me, why wasn't staff already out there handing out 
the wristbands and letting all the other people know you're not going to get one. There is no reasonable, justifiable reason why anyone should have to wait three and a half hours before someone tells them no party for you, <laughs> no soup for you. You know, there's no reason why anyone should sit there in the cold. It's such an un unwelcoming, unhospitable environment when you're waiting that long and it's so unpredictable it's just unsettling. Like, you don't know, like, it, it, am I going to be the one? Am I not going to be the one? It, is it, you know, once I was like a, an hour in and I was counting and I was trying to visualize and I couldn't get any of my kids to go with me so that I could like go through the, to the front end line. And like, I was trying to think of all these things that I could do to kind of figure out whether, you know, it was a guessing game and, uh, and it becomes kind of ruthless, like survival of the fittest almost uh, kind of experience. I started thinking, shoot, I'm way too vested in this at this point. I can't walk away. That was an hour in. And then an hour and a half in, I was like, darn, I should have walked away an hour ago. <laughs> I mean, you know, 30 minutes ago. You know, I started doing all these crazy mind games with myself uh, because it just kept getting colder and colder. And so my point is, uh, th this shouldn't be. I shouldn't have been doing this, you know, I, and I'm glad that I did because I learned a lot and I got a lot of information from that, but none of our residents should have that kind of experience, especially when we're trying to entice them to get this vaccine, when it's this kind of uh, critical moment in our city uh, that we need to reopen this. And so, um, uh, so, so that's it. That, that's, that's all I wanted to add. Uh, so I want I want an update on on those vaccine sites, and I want to know what we're going to do to truly truly change the culture of the vaccine sites. What are we going to do to get into those uh, nooks and crannies? Get into those um, those out of the ordinary uh, uh, sites, and what are we going to do to change the schedules? Thank you, council member. And, and we, we, we agree with you very strongly that, that weekends, later hours, places that are closer to where people live and where people work um, are all really key in this next phase. And so when we come back at our next report out, we will include uh, detailed information on the events that we've had the ability to influence or the ones that we've had a higher degree of control over um, and what we've been able to, to do in regards to, to your feedback and, and others' feedback here and suggestions on how we approach that. Obviously, we don't control the vast majority of, of the work, but um, we, we definitely take the feedback very seriously and those things that are in our control, we'll report back out on and, and let you know how we're doing in terms of improving that process and that culture and reducing the amount of friction, because I completely agree with you. The harder it is to, to get something, the more people turn off and, and even a little bit of friction uh, can turn people off who are facing a lot of barriers in terms of childcare, in terms of, of uh, missing work when they're needing to pay pay rents and, and pay for food. So we'll, we'll try to make the process as frictionless as possible and take into account uh, how we can make it uh, fair and equitable as well for those who are participating. So thank you very much. And I really appreciate the feedback and we'll incorporate that into the strategy over the next month and going forward. And, and may, may I add just one thing? <clears throat> and this is a controversial point. <clears throat> People are gonna have different opinions on this. Uh, I know that um, that in an effort to be inclusive of everybody, uh, and, and we're in a very different political uh, realm right now, and, and I know everybody's tiptoeing uh, in order, everybody's tiptoeing around everybody in order not to step on, on people's toes. I get that. So, and I'm very sensitive about it. But, um, but in, in, in an effort sometimes to be extremely inclusive, of everybody, sometimes we're exclusive. I want. I just want us to take that in a little bit. And I think we can vet this out more because um, I don't want to have this philosophical conversation here necessarily because this, this could be a whole session just on this. But I'll tell you that, that I think we have to be very mindful of the word Latinx. That's not necessarily inclusive of my mother of my father, of the older generation. And so when you put that word out there, you're not necessarily speaking to them. 
So if they see a flyer and they see the word Latinx, it doesn't speak to them. It doesn't speak to the immigrant community, which is whom we're trying to bring in. And when you look at some of the census tracts in my district, we're still at 37%, 37%. And I would challenge to see who are they? And I bet you anything that they are primarily immigrant communities. It's not the Asian community that's at 37%, it's the Latino community. And I would venture even to, uh, to say that if you were to ask them how they identify, they wouldn't say Latinx. They would say Mexicano, Salvadoreño, Nicaragüense, or Latino. But they wouldn't say Latinx. And so Latinx is something that we feel very comfortable, some of us, because we think that it's inclusive because it's become very scholarly. It's part of the political climate currently, but it does truly exclude much of our immigrant community who just does not identify with that. In fact, it rewrites our language and many of us feel very disrespected by it. And so I'm putting that out there so that we can think this through a little bit in terms of how we speak culturally appropriately to our community that we're trying to bring in. Thank you, council member. Words matter. Uh, how people are named and named themselves is very powerful and very important. And it's an area that I, I, for one, continue to learn into and don't pretend to have the answers. So I appreciate you raising it. And it's, it's one that, that, as you said, is probably a much longer and deeper discussion, but I, I appreciate it being raised and, and we'll think very thoughtfully about it and, and bring it back to the team to, to talk through to see how we communicate and how we name uh, people and the communities that we're talking about and, and certainly do not want to be or be perceived to be disrespectful or, or missing out on uh, key people who we want to be able to hear what we have to say and we want to be able to hear from them as well. So thank you for raising that. Thank you, that's it for me, Mayor. Thanks, thanks, Kip. Uh, Councilman Davis. Thank you. I want to uh, thank my colleagues for all of their questions and, and points raised. And I also want to thank staff for this report, especially the vaccination um, information and the, the map. Um, I had a had a look at the map. I heard you and say about the Buena Vista neighborhood. I want to follow up with you. I just this is just a placeholder. I don't want to bring it up here. Um, in depth, but Buena Vista neighborhood needing vaccinations. And there's another neighborhood I noticed from the map, um, the Farm Drive neighborhood that's in my district. So I'm gonna connect with you offline on those and hopefully we can get some in neighborhood. I have a couple of sites in mind if we can get some vaccination uh, events out there it would be great. So just wanted to let you know, I was gonna be contacting you about those. Um, and then I want to thank Councilmember Foley for bringing up National Night Out and want to ask Kip along that on the same vein, um, since people are able to uh, gather outside now, are block parties also something that would be allowed? Yeah, that's a good one as well. So um, they're outdoor gatherings, they can be done safely. Um, we haven't, uh, this is also a good catch. We haven't necessarily put the same uh, time and attention to that, but I, I, um, I'm i gonna ask, I can see she's probably taking the notes right now as I'm talking, ask Kelly to add that to, to the list because I know we are all of us ready to get to the place where we can safely gather with our neighbors. Um, and block parties are a beautiful way to connect and to reconnect. So uh, we'll add that to the list in terms of, of timing for reopening and approach for that. Thank, thank you for the suggestion and the catch. We had not caught that. Great, appreciate it. The nice thing about block parties is if they're blocking off a street, they've got lots and lots of space to, to spread out in. So um, hoping we can get those, those going sooner rather than later. Um, I know people are eager to, to connect with, with their neighbors and their friends and family. So I think this would be a good way to, especially in some of the areas where they they may be a little bit more densely packed in, having having the block parties gives gives a nice big space for people to spread out. Got yeah, two thousand four hundred miles of streets. We can use some of those for. That's for right. That's right.
Okay. That's it for me. Thank you, Council Member. Are there any other questions on item 3.1? Thanks again to our hardworking teams uh, across the city that are working on these critical issues to save lives and help us recover. All right, uh, we'll move on then. Uh, I believe next up is uh, item 3.3, .3, which is the uh, COVID preliminary operational assessment report revision, which I think is probably gonna have the same folks, maybe with Reard, Ray Reardon as well. Welcome. Well, thank you, uh, Mayor, City Council, City Manager, and members of the public here today. I'm Ray Reardon, the Director of the City Manager's Office of Emergency Management. There's no formal presentation today on this item. Uh, at the March 2nd City Council meeting, the Council accepted the original report and recognized that the operational assessment report as a public record documenting what happened and who was affected that we should include six other scenes. Attachment one of the matrix shows uh, the, the various scenes that the, the Council members asked to, to have included in the report and those changes were made. So we're, we're now presenting this report for acceptance. I'm sorry, Ray, I had to check out for a moment there. Are we having a problem with the... Um, what I was saying, Mayor, is that the council accepted the report at the March 2nd meeting with uh, suggestions on adding six different themes uh, to be more clear in a report. Uh, attachment one, the matrix demonstrates those, those six themes and where the changes were made to report. So we're presenting this report back for uh, final acceptance. Great, thank you, Ray. Please forgive me. I was. Uh... Uh, switching devices. Hopefully everybody can hear me fine now. Yes. Good. Fabulous. Thanks. All right. We're full speed ahead. Uh, all right. Any questions, comments, and thank you for incorporating all of our feedback. Let's go to the members. Do you accept the report? Motion from Council Member Foley. Second. Second. Second from the Vice Mayor. Uh, Mr. Beekman, do you want to speak on this item or a different item? Mr. Bigman, your device is muted right now. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Yeah, I wanted to speak uh, on this item if possible. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is about uh, financial, how we can work financially. And it sounds like with emergency preparedness ideas with Ray Reardon here uh, for this item. Uh, I first wanted to really thank Councilperson Arenas for her last item, uh, for what she spoke about. I mean, for to her, for us to make it a clear process, anything we can do to make things a, a more clear, understandable process for people, we have to do that this summer. I think that's an important goal. And I guess that's an important goal of this meeting is to establish that and work towards that. And uh, good luck to ourselves, how we work towards that. Um, for instance, I've been mentioning uh, for a few weeks now, the, the new secondary HVAC systems that we've been placing in schools and in hotels and in the businesses. Uh, you know, County of Santa Clara just had a, a board of supervisor item that, you know, they want to create, you know, funding sources for small businesses for HVAC systems and what's called their uh, an air quality component to it uh, to help fund such a, such a program for small businesses. It's really important we learn, I think, to ask what exactly the HVAC systems are capable of. And, you know, they really can help out. And it, we shouldn't be fearful to talk about its subject matter. And it may have like a secondary uh, aerosol vaccine process that I, I, I don't think we have to be afraid to talk about that issue if, if accurate. And uh, it's important to learn to have open conversations about these things. Uh, they're helping us survive, basically. And it's not a matter of how you can be cool city government anymore. It is a practice of how we do good practices and share information as a community. It's incredibly vitally important to work towards that. Thank you. Thank you. Returning back to the council, uh, Councilman Rennes. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, th thank you for um, including um, 
some of the recommendations that I made um, in, uh, I think in April, I don't know. I, this is COVID, meeting. what was it, Ray? It was the March council meeting. March, okay. It, you know what, um, COVID is ruining my timeline and <laughs> I, I can never tell when last week was, it feels so long ago. Okay, um, uh, you know, we met and we talked about this and, and I wanna thank Chief Mata and of course yourself, Ray, for incorporating, um, really memorializing some of the efforts that can be made for um, gender-based violence uh, during a pandemic. And I know it's specific and I've been saying this, that, that this is not um, for only for our city, that, that this is something that a lot of uh, young girls and women uh, face. Um, in, during during any pandemic. So I, I was hoping that we could um, go to the attachment one. Um, and I think where it says, um, I think it's under council's um, council session comments. It, it, it says something about, um, I think it only, uh, 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 and it, it's my comment. <laughs> so I think I only spoke regarding domestic violence. Or I think I had said around sexual assault and violence. Um, I don't know if I said um, DV, but it, regardless, I'm hoping that we can change this to gender-based violence. So instead of domestic violence to gender-based violence, because that could be inclusive of human trafficking. It could be inclusive of intimate partner violence. It could be inclusive of sexual assault. Um, unfortunately, but but I think it's more appropriate. And so I think that's the only um, edit that I'd like to make at this point. And, um, and really for our city to think about um, in, the, in the current state that we're in, what further um, efforts we are making to continually address um, intimate partner violence, especially with our um, communities um, and gender-based violence, especially with our communities that are um, so overcrowded at this point. And because of the pandemic, we are all really um, inside. And sometimes with those perpetrators, um, especially children under the age of 12 and children under the age of 17, those are the two top groups. And as we've seen in past um, uh, reports and this uh, last week, we just had a joint meeting with the county um, one of the items that we noticed is that there was a lot more um, sexual assault happening in residential um, areas. And so, of course, it, it, it is to be expected. People are not out and, um, you know, going to parties or going to clubs or things of that sort. And so we're finding it more at home. But I don't know that that's any different any other time, maybe just a, 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 bit, a bit higher than normal. Um, but for that age range, I think you would typically find that first um, um, because it, most of those assaults happen with somebody that that particular child or young person knows. Um, so, so uh, Dave, you know, I, this is an, a question in terms of, of, and I don't know if, if the chief is here or not, but I think, you know, it, it just, it would be wonderful to hear in terms of this is this is for future and I know I think we're going to come back um, uh, to hear some of the work that's done from October to now. Um, uh, but it, it would be great in, the, in a future report to see what are some of those um, strategies that that our police department changed to adapt and to res be responsive to our sexual assault. Um, uh, and gender-based violence. Um, and I'm sure there was, you know, there was many things that those investigative units did. Um, there's probably some training. It, it, it would just be uh, great to see that summarized somehow. Yeah, very good, council member. Thank you. And that's it. And I uh, move to approve. I, th I think there's a motion already. Oh, I'm so sorry. I apologize about that. Okay, no worries. Uh, all right, then let's vote on council member Foley's motion. Jimenez. Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Davis? Yes. Yes. Arenas? Got yes. it. And that's yes for Arenas? Yes. 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 Foley? Foley? Aye. 
Ahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, uh, 3.4 is the fiscal recovery update and appropriation actions regarding our pandemic response. I see Jim is lurking, but do you have a presentation, Jim? I don't think you do. No, Mayor. You're just lurking. Okay, great. Uh, with Lee and the whole team, Kip. Uh, all right, let's go to members of the public. That's an excellent report. There's a lot of dollars being allocated. We appreciate everyone's hard work getting those dollars to our communities in need. Mr. Beekman. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Uh, these are the financial issues of COVID that I, I wanted to really get into uh, for this item. Um, you know, I talked in the beginning of the meeting at public uh, consent calendar that, you know, uh, the, the subsidy process is really helping out local community energy at this time. And uh, I think it's important to consider the subsidy process. We have to be more proactive in how we consider the use of subsidy over the next uh, four or five years. It's very possible we have an upcoming earthquake that I've been mentioning trying to make it a regular part of the, my public comments so we can prepare for it uh, in the next few years. And it seems like, uh, you know, I hope I can get some feedback about that subject and, and learn to better talk about it in the future. But for now, um, it's my feeling that if we learn good subsidy ideas now, um, that will help prepare us for the next few years. And uh, the questions that we come out of subsidy in the next five years, you know, it's, it's five years from now, what is the future of subsidy? I don't think subsidy is a thing that can last forever. What are our next steps out of subsidy? But then again, you know, subsidy and, and the federal funding that we're receiving right now, I'm just learning, maybe it's okay, maybe it's enough. Uh, it's an interesting, good way to work. It's a way that we're familiar with and that we trust and it can do, and it can do amazing, incredible things for ourselves at this time. So maybe it is a system that can be okay. Um, these are the kind of conversations that we really have to have this summer. And this is how we're gonna build our future out of the COVID era. And we have to address these issues honestly and openly with each other for this summer. And I hope we uh, take the time to work on it. And I'm trying to make it clear here in my own tiny way. Uh, good luck in, in this effort to work on these issues. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, back to the council. Any questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. Okay, all right. Uh, is there a motion? Oh, I see Councilman Rennes. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, just, just a quick question about, um, since I brought up some advertising, Spanish-based advertising in my um, a, a previous comment, I'm wondering if we're allocating sufficient funding um, for for Spanish-based media and some of the suggestions I had made. Since it sounds like it, I know that those those um, efforts were already in motion. He leads off mic, so I'm going to let him answer. I was going to be there in support of you, Kip, um, oh. but happy to jump in. We do have money allocated. Um, within communications in general, but specifically within the vaccination task force for translation services, as well as media buys and targeted outreach. With these actions, we are also be moving additional money into uh, communication support, specifically for the vaccination branch. Um, and you will hear more about that on uh, May 17th when we come forward with the American Relief Package funding recommendations as well. Um, great, but there's enough funding uh, for now uh, for those efforts. I know that this is not touching the ARP uh, funds just yet. Yeah, I know there's plenty of funding for those efforts now. Okay, great. So it won't be a matter of resources. Um, the, the other pieces that I'm wondering is in terms of the isolation funds um, and to, to be really effective for those families to, um, that are in need, um, are, are we starting to see like maybe there's um, the, that the promotoras are, are maybe integrating um, some of that information into um, their contacts, the way that they engage families um, uh, and provide direct referrals. Is that something that is happening? 
So this is Jackie morales Rand, the director of the housing department. Hi, um, I can double check, so I don't want to say for sure, but we are, we have been trying to use multiple contact points to push out multiple pieces of information. I mean, the good news about the isolation and quarantine contract is that although we see the numbers going down in terms of people who have contracted COVID-19, we saw a much greater penetration of people who are actually using the services. So once they started doing the door-to-door -door, uh, outreach to the communities, so actually I think I know the answer. So yes, because they started doing that door-to-door -door outreach um, in specific targeted neighborhoods, they saw a much greater usage of the program. But next, we're hoping to get this on the agenda next week, and county staff will be will be with me uh, and can provide additional information when they come to the council. Uh, thank you, Jackie. And you know, I, I know that you know this already uh, in terms of the lack of inventory of hotels um, on the east side. And if there is another surge of of infection, uh, you know, I'm going to knock on wood you know, uh, cross my fingers that none of that happens. But in case that happens, that that we have a very, um, um, uh, that we have hotels that are the closest thing in terms, um, you know, to facilitate that move. I know that I um, spoke to some folks who were offered um, hotels like in Sunnyvale um, and, you know, that, and, and, which is wonderful, but it might not, be uh, realistic um, because they, you know they don't provide food on site, and so you have to rely on somebody bringing you something to eat, unless you, you know, snack on chips all day. Um, so, so I'm just hoping that we can um, be as cognizant as we can for those folks who um, who are going to be in the highest need for this, um, that we provide um, those hotels as close as we can, and I. I'm sure that you're, you've already thought of that. I just want to make sure that we're thinking ahead in case there's a, another surge. And I see you shaking your head, Jackie. Yes, yes, thank you. I think actually you all have mentioned this before, now that I'm hearing you say it again, that the location of the hotels were challenging for some people. So I will just, I will make sure that the county has that information. Great. I, I appreciate that. And really, those are all my questions. I'm always um, grateful when there isn't a presentation because there's not a lot of questions. Uh, the, the information is very clear. And Jim, I always appreciate you um, hanging around to, to answer any of the, the big questions here. But there are no big questions. We I can see that there's a lot of savings here that are now going to food and necessities and, um, and other areas that, that are just um, vital for for to continue to support our community. So I'm, I'm really grateful about that. And I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Motion and second. Any other comments? All right. Uh, thanks everybody for your hard work in aligning all these funding sources. And uh, we know there's, there's a lot of money, but much more need. So appreciate uh, the great work. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Rales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Jones? Aye. Cardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. We're on to item. 3.5, which is report on bids and the award of the contract for a Pele. Pellier Park. And is there no, uh, there's no presentation on this one? Okay. Uh, Councilor Prowlis will come to you in just a moment. Let me just check to see if any members of the public would like to speak on this item. Again, this is 3.5, the Pellier Park project. Seeing no hands, I'm going to come back. Congratulations, Councilmember Prowlis. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor, um, and thank you to uh, city staff for your work on this project and, and being able to get it to this point. Um, just wanted to, to 
issue my appreciation for this and, and really excitement in regards to moving forward on this park. This is the, the last step here, or one of the last steps before we're gonna go ahead and actually uh, break ground. And so just excited about this coming forward and I'll um, uh, move uh, my memorandum, which is just moving staff uh, report. Second. Thank you, council member. And uh, it's only a decade and a half in coming. We appreciate all the hard work and perseverance uh, park staff that's driving it home now is different than the ones who are trying to get us to get it going uh, a decade and a half ago but there were a lot of challenges i know with streets that had to get realigned um, and infrastructure and everything else so grateful that we're at this point um, i just had one question about nicole just about the the design um, it seems as though there's an awful lot of uh, impervious surface in, in this particular park design. And I understand not every park is gonna be a giant soccer field, um, but I just wonder to what extent are, are we driving? Yeah, I just raised this question more generally, you know, not as a critique of this particular park, but um, knowing that certainly drives up capital costs. And if you ask most kids, they'd say, I'd, I'd really just be happier with a, a lot of grass to go play on. Um, this, yeah. This, I mean, how do you how do you balance those concerns? No, oh, thank you, Mayor. It's a, it's a great question, Nicole Burnham, Deputy Director of Capital Programs for Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services. I think it's an important topic, and it, and it's one um, we talk a lot about um, in our design team. And you might recall that last week when we were here with North San Pedro and Bassett, we talked about how these three parks, um, Pelier, North San Pedro, and Bassett, kind of fit together as a system and, and Pellier is kind of the place to gather, right? And so we see that as a high intensity use space where there will be a lot of activity and a lot of people. And then, and so when we put softscape and a lot of grass in spaces like that, it can become an incredible challenge for us to maintain. So in this space, our intent was for, we certainly have some grass space and some natural environment that's accessible there, but the intent was for it to be more of um, a robust design that can stand up to a lot of high intensity use. And then you see in the other two parks, as you move away from North San Pedro Market, you know, we get into a softer landscape. So, so it, it wouldn't be the norm for sure, um, but the way this system of parks worked, that, that was, we felt the right choice for this particular park. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Appreciate the response. Okay, let's vote on Councilmember Perales' motion. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Owen? Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. As far as um, Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Um, we're going to pick, a, we're going to skip item 3.6, which is designated to be heard at 6 p.m. So we're going to go on to item 7.1, which is the Urban Confluence Silicon Valley Design Rankings and Future Work Plan. We do have a presentation on this item. and. Nicole, thanks to you and your team for all your hard work. Do indeed have a presentation, Mayor. So uh, let's see if I can get it loaded here. Okay, so um, thank you, Mayor and City Council. Uh, I'm Nicole Burnham, Deputy Director, Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Services. Uh, I'll be leading this presentation just to, to get us through it and keep us moving, um, but I am joined by John Cicerelli. Director of Parks and Recreation. And I also have um, in the audience, we do have Steve Borkenhagen, Christine uh, Davis, and John Ball, as well as members of their design team who are here to answer questions as well. So, as some of you may recall, the Urban Confluence team came to PRNS in the city in 2017 with a proposal to rebuild in Plaza de Cesar Chavez the historic light tower that once stood at the intersection of Market and Santa Clara streets. Since that time, this project certainly has evolved considerably. Uh, the project proponent known as San Jose Light Tower Corporation completed a site selection study in 2018 that considered various locations for this gift to the city. Once Arena Green was selected as the preferred location and city council authorized the project to move forward in March, 2019, the corporation prepared a design competition brief and posted it in July of 2019. 
this is where this slide picks up and gives you some time frames. Uh, the initial deadline for submittals was intended to be in early 2020, uh, but COVID actually waylaid this project as well as so many others. Um, and uh, in August, uh, so final submittals were due in August, um, July of 2020. In August of 2020, a community competition panel recommended 47 submittals of the 963 entries that were received from throughout the world. A jury of design professionals from across the world selected three finalists from those 963 entries. And the three finalists submitted more detailed design um, information in, to the corporation in January 2021. And the jury selected a finalist in March of 2021. So throughout the past two years, the Urban Confluence team has coordinated numerous outreach efforts regarding this project. These included site walks that involved a number of people and professionals, some of which I attended and supported, uh, project meetings, and regular updates were posted on the project's website. Uh, this work was done as a result of the direction provided in the March 2019 Council memo. That I think, and I think there's actually a link to that memo in your um, in the current in the today's Council memo. So the jury recommended uh, Breeze of Innovation as the finalist and as the, as the preferred winner. Uh, in evaluating entries, the jury was asked to consider criterion such as visual presence, sensitivity to the existing park infrastructure, cultural sensitivity, environmental sustainability, and uh, among other criterion that were listed in the council memo. The winning design, Breeze of Innovation, was submitted by architect Fair Jerez, uh, for smart, from Smart Architecture Studio. The architectural design aims to create a landmark structure that makes clean energy harvesting obvious and simple in order to trigger, to change perception, to question reality, and to inspire. And that's a quote from the designer. Uh, the project is inspired to send a message that clean energy is entirely possible and that large public projects can demonstrate leadership on this issue. So now that that design has been selected, uh, some might say this is when the real work is going to start, <laughs> um, which is probably ironic for, uh, for Steve and John and Christine to hear because they've done a lot of work to date, as we all have. Um, the council memo outlines steps that will need to be completed before the project can move forward to construction, and those items are listed here on the slide, but I'll walk through each of them briefly. Um, with regard to schedule, PRNS has asked for a project schedule with specific milestones for the project. We want to be able to identify critical points, not just for the design development, but also for fundraising and construction. Um, in recent years, PRNS really hasn't pursued improvements at Arena Green because we know that this project is going to generate significant changes there. Um, and the development timeline is going to become important for us as we consider evaluating future city funded improvements to the park. Um, and it's also going to be important to have a schedule so we understand how various departments may need to staff up or down to support the project. Um, with regard to a fundraising plan, um, for a project of this magnitude with a cost estimate of 100 to $150 million, we know there will need to be a robust and aggressive fundraising plan. But because the project is located on city property, we know the city needs to participate in and guide the development of the fundraising plan to ensure the giving levels and name recognitions are consistent with city policy. We have done this with the Levitt group. We've done this with other groups that have done fundraising plans for in city parks for projects. Design development in some ways might be the most straightforward part of this work plan. Um, development of construction plans and methods, um, while it's a complicated project, um, it, is, it is something that uh, that will take significant effort given its size and complexity, but it is something that I think the design community can address. Um, while it's a private development, the fact that it's on city property and will be a public asset suggests that staff need to fully support and participate in design development. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that the corporation has completed basic outreach as part of the project's concept development. Um, the project location being within a city park suggests that staff should lead future outreach and engagement on this project. But equally important, this project will likely necessitate a redesign of Arena Green given its size and complexity. Um, the park will look very different after the structure is built and we'll need to consider how that space will fit. Um, 
within the context of Guadalupe River Park overall, but also how it will it will fit within the plan that Google has for the Downtown West project, where there's a robust open space planned immediately adjacent to this site. With regard to EIR, I know there's been a, a large amount of public discourse about potential environmental impacts. Um, and this says to us as staff that a really thoughtful and thorough staff-led EIR will be a critical part of the project. While many project in private projects, the developer often completes the EIR on behalf of the city for this project because it is in a city park and given its level of complexity, staff believes that we need to manage and lead the EIR process for this project. Uh, and the, and the, la the next two items about maintenance and, and business planning, I think you know, certainly there's going to need to be a thoughtful plan. I think the developer understands this. Um, and we're very early on in development of this, of these two concepts, like right? how are we going to generate revenue, if at all, from this structure? And how are we going to maintain it? And those are two critically important elements. Even if a third party operator like a conservancy is established to maintain it, I think it's still something we need to be thoughtful about. Uh, because again, since it's on city property, it will come back to the city if the, if the maintenance plan fails. So all of these work items um, will certainly need various agreements with the city, um, which staff will need to develop and coordinate with the with the project proponent. We expect staff from PRNS, Public Works, Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement, and the airport will all need to contribute to this project in various ways. In light of this, staff does acknowledge and appreciate Councilmember Davis's recommendations regarding the need for staff funding to support the project. Of particular note for PRNS's work um, is this item about the city charter and ordinance review. Section 1700 of the city charter calls for parks to be inalienable except by a vote of the electorate. The charter goes on to limit the city's ability to enter into contracts for more than three years unless, very cer unless certain specific requirements are met. Projects with contracts longer than three years must demonstrate that they provide recreational enhancements to the park system. This charter provision impacts partners throughout the park system and would most certainly limit operations for this project. Um, PRNS has long recognized that this charter provision does, does impact our partners. And so we sought and received a grant from the Knight Foundation and we've hired a consultant to evaluate this provision and its associated ordinance ordinances, um, and we expect to complete this work in spring of 2022. We can't predict what the outcome will be. You know, I can't predict that we actually will achieve an ordinance change. So there is the complexity of the work plan. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, wanted to make sure you all had that. And so with that, I'm going to wrap it up, but leave you with the recommended action, which is that you accept the staff report um, and accept the jury recommended rankings of the three finalists that you accept the expected work plan for the next phase of the project and acknowledge the staff and budget resources that will be required to move the project forward. Um, and as previously mentioned, we do, staff does support the recommendations put forward by Council Member Davis in her supplemental memo. Great, thank you very much, Nicole. All right, let's go to uh, members of the community first and then we'll come back to the council for discussion and comment. Uh, Catherine Hedges. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor and Council. Um, I have a number of concerns about the um, urban confluence project, uh, primarily the light pollution. Um, besides concerns about the wildlife and the river corridor, um, I think it's going to create a lot of light pollution for people living downtown and outside downtown. We're planning to put uh, four to 6,000 apartments into the Google West, uh, downtown West Google project. And it just seems really short-sighted to put a giant light hazard blocks away from there. It's gonna be casting light up into the sky, even if it is on the other side of the uh, shark tank. And it can't be good for wildlife. And it, and they say they're going to be responsible for the maintenance, but who knows how long this organization is going to last? I don't want the city stuck with a white elephant that requires a lot of maintenance and cleaning and and um, 
just to put a big fancy thing under the flight path to the airport so people can recognize San Jose. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Pamela Campos. Hello, um, good afternoon, members of the uh, City Council and Mayor Licardo. I am a lifelong resident of San Jose. I am so proud to call this city my hometown, and I am truly in opposition of this project moving forward. I hope that uh, council members can take into consideration the outcry of community who are not in favor of this project for many reasons. Uh, we just heard the staff um, talk about the time, and uh, that is clearly an in-kind donation of staff resources and, and financing to work on this project when we are in the middle of a pandemic and really need to be strategic about where our staff time and resources that the city has are going. Um, this is a project that I don't believe was created with community in mind. As I said, I'm a lifelong resident and did not have really any opportunities to feel like my voice uh, was being heard. I believe that the panel and the way that the project was chosen um, was not one that was representative of the community. And um, I, I recognize that the city of San Jose has a long history of appeasing the interests of the wealthy. And it is the people of color who are oppressed, particularly in East San Jose. We have a dire need to invest in that community for the future economic prosperity of those citizens. And so the philanthropic dollars that are going towards this project could better be used developing the streets of San Jose, developing the childcare that is so desperately needed in our city. It's a disgrace that our county is the 10th uh, in highest need of childcare spaces when we have so much economic wealth. So please consider what the community truly needs and it is not this project, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dave, welcome. Dave, you're, you seem to be muted right now. I think you unmuted and then muted again. Give that another shot. There as, you go. As a, as a resident of San Jose and former employee steeped in the HP Way culture of respect, uh, developed by Silicon Valley founders Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, I don't see myself nor the diversity of cultures uh, of San Jose in breeze of innovation. I see only minor innovation and little beauty. I don't fault the artists, despite residents' warning, they were constrained by the unwavering Light Tower Corporation's top-down requirements. But philanthropists, we don't have to be constrained by their demands. Let's instead raise 100 million to create a collection of art installations in each neighborhood throughout the city that represents their culture and their inspiration that collectively form the grandest uh, cultural ex exhibit anywhere, employing, training, and empowering youth from every corner of this diverse city. And let's create a grand gateway to Coyote Valley of upturned palms that provide safe passage for wildlife. Let's hire youth, the troubled homeless to restore the wetlands, oak forests, and employ them in innovative uh, climate healing, regenerative agriculture. Let's create the nature-based and agriculture tourism that will form the grandest park of any city in the nation. And let's make the Dearden train station a masterpiece of architectural beauty. Let's train uh, a, a construction force that, uh, at this station that will celebrate the grandest crossroads of peoples from every corner of the planet west of the Grand Central Station. And that sparks a new renaissance in agri or architecture for the next century. Council members, please at least require a city produced survey of public interest. Moving the Light Tower Corporation's uh, top down process forward at this time would be a sad example of what's wrong in Silicon Valley, ignoring community and those sensitive to the voiceless and the health of the planet when alternatives exist and when we need more public in public art. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Beekman? Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Uh, council committee meetings uh, the past few weeks, it's been mentioned that uh, this light tower project could possibly uh, attract uh, migrating birds at night. 
uh, with its lights, and that may create a hazard for uh, incoming or outgoing uh, airplanes. So I just thought I'd mention that. And I wanted to mention it with this project and with the previous project about parks uh, in general, um, as you're building the future of parks, uh, I hope you're considering the, the, the good of open public policies in the technology and surveillance that you'll have in a park. And that can be a, a, an easier process to learn how to share uh, open public policies uh, uh, of this technology you will be having in parks. And uh, it's an important concept to learn. I hope it's, it's just simply, it becomes an easier process and it doesn't have to be a process of deep state. It's not a deep state secret that our, that our city has uh, technology and surveillance. Um, I, I, that's the future we have to learn how to work to build towards. Um, you know, we're not at war anymore and it isn't a question about war, it's, a, it's our community. Uh, we've we've elected, you know, to have uh, parks put into place. I mean, why do you get a, a corner market as government on the surveillance and technology? And how come you can't share that technology and make it an open public subject uh, with the everyday public? Um, it's a lot to learn. I hope we're learning these lessons. We're trying to leave the era of war. We're trying to ask questions of sustainability. And uh, these are the ways to ask these questions. And uh, so good luck in how we move forward into our future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Esther Dong, welcome. Hello, council members. My name is Esther Young. I am 17 years old and I'm here with the San Jose Youth Climate Action Team. The Urban Conference Silicon Valley stated that the breeze of innovation is meant to represent the diversity and culture of Silicon Valley. Frankly, I don't believe that this structure will meet its intended purpose. Each individual pipe is meant to represent one tech com company based in Silicon Valley. But what about the people who live here? How will they be represented by a bunch of 200 feet tall metal pipes that, as far as I can tell, just shows off the money donations from these tech companies? With the intended $100 million or more in order to build the structure, I firmly believe that this money can be better allocated to create other beautiful monuments, such as murals, that can truly represent the people that live in the city and Silicon Valley as a whole. Additionally, the structure emitting immense light pollution can become a serious hazard for both flying birds and aircraft approaching or leaving nearby San Jose International Airport. I urge you to oppose the construction of the breeze of innovation. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Brian Schmidt. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and City Council. This is Brian Schmidt from Green Foothills. We oppose this project as it is designed and in the current location and request that you stop the work planning on this project so something else can be done. Um, as staff has pointed out, there will be an environmental analysis of the project, but one can already tell significant major uh, light impacts in what could not be a worse location than this. This is the absolute worst, worst location, right by two streams um, with a lot of effect on the environment, right by Los Gatos Creek and Guadalupe, Guadalupe River. So uh, there'll be a limited opportunity to do put in the effort of a major project like this, why move forward on uh, what is already an incorrect design? And uh, uh, among the environmental problems of this is it's not just a, a light, major light source, but it'll be a moving light source. It'll be even very difficult to do an adequate environmental analysis. And while we do not purport to be uh, financial uh, experts, um, the maintenance of this project is also going to be a significant problem in terms of cost. And that raises concerns about whether any of the mitigations are going to be adequately financed. But for those reasons, and as many of our supporters have written to you all, request that you, uh, you indicate that you're opposed to the project and stop the work plan at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shani, welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor Licardo and Council. I'm a scientist and I've been doing a lot of research on light. And in the past six months, seven months maybe, a lot of information has been coming out on the impacts of light on all organismal levels from the cellular to the uh, ecosystem and global environment. 
um, and human health. So this left all of us environmental organization with the responsibility of telling you, this is not the right place. This is not the right project. Light is unhealthy for the environment. Um, I understand that, uh, and we were told repeatedly that CEQA will tell us how to solve this problem and CEQA will provide the mitigations, but we have a lot of experience with CEQA. CEQA does not require avoidance, only some mitigation, not even full mitigation of an impact. So they could potentially get away with very minor mitigations. And with our experience with this particular group, it didn't build trust. We were dealt with in a very disrespectful way. Uh, I have not had any other developer ever tell me, and I'm an immigrant, I'm a small woman, I have an accent, Nobody ever told me that they feel sorry for me, that my brain needs to be rewired so I can understand the beauty of their proposal. And I have to say, it's pretty traumatic for me. So um, I don't think there's a lot of trust. All our comments were ignored. A gift to the city should be something that is not opposed by so many people. You've been receiving letters from groups and from individuals. Everybody says thanks, but no thanks. And the gift to the city should not have that. It should be, oh yeah, great, we love it. It's not. I think it's time to stop this process. It puts too much, uh, too much impact on city resources and will continue to do so because we're not giving up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sunath, welcome. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Sanath Mathavati and I am a junior at Lindbergh High School as well as Commission Chair of the Environmental Commission of the Sunnyvale Youth Public Policy Institute. I strongly ask that we reconsider this project. The tower is meant to represent innovation and sustainability, but its very existence under this meaning is hypocritical as it will destroy our night sky with light pollution. I ask you to see the reef and its sign in Los Angeles and how damaging that has been. And you'll be devastating for local wildlife. Arena Green Park is home to two riparian corridors, both of which will be raised by the light. Insects and fowl will be disoriented, and nocturnal species and other species reliant on circadian rhythms will be astray. And the structure will cut off viable and safe living spaces for dozens of species. Although the construction of one obnoxious 200-foot gift may not be the end-all be-all for the city's environment, passing its construction will be a symbolic allowance for other destructive structures to come. I ask you to consider what the structure means for me and my fellow youth who will grow up admiring its artificialness but losing the natural beauty of the sky. Who will grow up to watch more similar structures inspired by this project be built in a domino effect of disastrous light pollution and youth who will grow up to lose the beautiful birds to collisions and squirrels to failed circadian hormones to even insects who will be drawn to the gift only to die in it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Dashiell, welcome. Hello, my name is Dashiell Leeds. I'm the conservation assistant for the Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter. This project is intended to be a tribute to the electric light tower of 1881, which was an ecological disaster, killing so many birds that police officers on the beat would collect dead birds off of the ground and sell them to restaurants. This new light tower will also be an ecological disaster. With 200 foot tall illuminated rods looming over the confluence of the Los Gatos Creek and the Guadalupe River. Scientific experts have voiced their concerns about this project throughout the entire process and have gone unheeded. Artificial light at night disrupts the circadian rhythms of all living beings, humans included. This can lead to serious health complications in people and can be fatal for wildlife, especially for birds. The science behind this is clear and the damage this project could cause is also clear. This project is intended to symbolize San Jose, but by building a structure that emits light at night against the wishes of the community and scientific experts in one of the most ecologically sensitive areas in the city, I can't help but worry about what this might symbolize. If built, this will become a symbol of environmental destruction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Arthur, welcome. Uh, am I unmuted? Uh, you are now, yeah. Good. Um, I strongly support this project 
I think it's a beautiful design. I think it's going to be a very important uh, symbol of San Jose, both for the city and the country and even the world. Uh, the, uh, it's not going to cost the taxpayers a nickel. Um, the, the questions about light pollution will be addressed. Uh, and I strongly support the project. And I hope the mayor and the council uh, approve it. Uh, I think it's really going to be a wonderful gift to San Jose. Now, if I had all of this money and you told me I could spend it any way I wanted, you know, each of us might have something else that we might want to spend the money with uh, on. But that's not what we have before us. We have this wonderful project being offered to the city at no taxpayer expense. And I think we, the only right thing to do is to accept it and enjoy it for generations to come. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, Katja, welcome. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Um, yeah, I'm Katja Irvin, and I'm a District 3 resident, and I was a member of the Light Tower jury. Thanks to all of you who asked for the Light Tower Corporation to include an environmental advocate on the jury. And um, participating in the jury was a lot of work, and it was very interesting listening to architects and designers talk about designs. However, since um, I was there to bring up environmental issues, the process was disappointing overall. Uh, the perspective of most of the jurors was to choose an architecturally innovative design and environmental considerations were not really a concern. And during the jury selection of the three finalists, I advocated against any projects that loomed over the river and four projects that were smaller and less intrusive. In the end, the light tower proponents admitted that they were looking for something tall and lighted. So the three finalists were all tall and lighted. So what a waste of a lot of people's time designing and evaluating projects that were not tall and lighted. But at least I was pleased none of the finalists included new bridges over the river and the ultimate winner was actually placed at the corner of the park as far away from the river as possible. However, when the projects came back for final selection, they all had moved closer to the river and all included new bridges over the river. It's such a disappointment. Um, so others have described the environmental impacts of this project in detail, and I just wanted to say that the jury process was focused on choosing the best design object with very little concern for environmental impacts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Edward? Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, council members. I wanted to thank council member Davis for her comments and to take them one step further. Nobody can deny that the city's financial realities have changed substantially since the project was considered in 2019. To those insisting that the project won't cost the city a dime, that's already not true. The staff report says unidentifiable costs, more information is needed. Who will pay staff time? Assuming just 20 hours a week, what parks or projects will be yet again underfunded or undermined to accommodate this gift? The city's track record with park maintenance is already fairly dismal, and this could make that worse for actual community serving parks. I've heard colloquially that some park staff are already spending more time on the urban confluence than they are on downtown West, which seems a very questionable priority. The Levitt Pavilion represents a fraction of this cost, and yet it continues to struggle with fundraising. Why should we assume this will fare any better? Redesign of Arena Green. On whose dime? We're waiving and reducing park fees left and right, and yet we accept that to accommodate a large corporate gift. We're willing to spend money that city staff and elected officials consistently claim we don't have when we mention the need to maintain and improve our current parks. A citywide survey should precede any next steps to confirm or deny whether or not the citizens of San Jose want this project. In regards to fundraising, we're talking about money that would otherwise go towards multiple smaller nonprofits that depend upon such funding. The message being sent is clear. Symbols are more important than citizens, and the council is willing to accommodate a single focused corporate gift at the expense of a much wider swath of the city's residents who are already underserved when it comes to parks and recreational facilities. Thank you. Uh, Nathan? Good, 
Good afternoon, Mayor Licardo and Council members. My name is Nathan Olsh, the Director of Policy and Operations at the San Jose Downtown Association. We would like to express our support for the breeze of innovation in this bold destination landmark that will be a positive icon of our community. As a member of the Arena Green Stakeholder Group, we are pleased to see this come before you today. It should be stated that the leadership at Urban Confluence Group have considered the mitigations for environmental concerns, specifically while the River Park, while also discovering ways to protect the repairing corridor with considerations of the airport as well. Moreover, the Breeze of Innovations has gained momentum to garner private and other funding that will be used, not city funds, to build, operate, and maintain the project. With 963 submissions from 72 countries, this is a once-in-a-lifetime moment to build a project that we could celebrate in San Jose in the heart of our city. We would like to encourage the City Council to accept the staff recommendations of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alan, welcome. Hello, um, am I unmuted? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Welcome. Okay, wonderful. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, Council members, and staff. My name is Alan Tian. I am a sophomore at Homsa High School, and I am a proud Bay Area resident. As a member of the, of the Sunnyvale Public Policy Institute of Environmental Commission, I strongly encourage the council to cancel the construction of the breeze of innovation due to its detrimental environmental harm, especially surrounding its adverse effects of our beloved bird species. According to the International Dark Sky Association, many bird species use moonlight and starlight to navigate at night. Nighttime artificial lights will lead to birds wandering off course towards dangerous landscapes where lights can be found. This has led to millions of bird collisions and deaths every year. Additionally, Nighttime lights may lead to migrating species moving too early or late and missing the ideal climate conditions, drastically reducing their chances of survival. The light pollution that the breeze of innovation will negatively impact hundreds of bird species, including many migrating birds and some endangered species of San Jose and beyond. For this reason, it is absolutely necessary for San Jose to hold its plan to raise funds for and to construct the breeze of innovation. Thank you for your time and consideration and for your service to our city and community. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Roland? Um, thank you, Mayor and uh, uh, Council. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. You know, I, I come from Europe, and these light towers are all over the world. If, if you want an iconic city like London or Paris, you must have one. London has one in front of a, a Victoria's a Palace Gardens. And if you look in a full bunch of letters, I'll send you a bunch of pictures to show you what it looks like from close up, including the people, you know, the activity that, that you have under the light. And then this thing shoots all the way up to the sky. And actually, Las Vegas and London are visible from space. You, you can see them from the International Space Station. So the only thing maybe I, I would do a little bit different is that I would not necessarily put that uh, in Arena Green. I know I'm going to get shut down for this, but maybe the um, um, a discovery, the park, you know, behind the Discovery Museum, where you went know, open when people assemble for the fireworks, maybe a, a more appropriate location. But I, I'm going to close off here and, and make it make this point to council. If you really want San Jose to have an iconic prime position on the world map, you don't have an option. You must go ahead with this project. Thank you. Thank you. Avi? Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Right. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Avi Zubramanian. I am 18 years old and here with the San Jose Youth Climate Action Team. So I'm here to oppose the construction of Breeds of Innovation due to its failure to acknowledge environmental consequences as well as practical purposes. So according to Urban Confluence Silicon Valley, the goal of this project is to represent the cultural and the culture and diversity of Silicon Valley as well as stay as environmentally conscious as possible through the use of wind power. In my eyes, neither of these goals are met successfully because one, I feel that this grouping of 200, of 200 foot tall metal pipes, let's say, each one intended to come from a local tech company does not represent me or any of my fellow youths who live in Silicon Valley. Secondly, I don't exactly see how this directly helps the community directly. Why not use the money allocated 
on local beautification projects such as green spaces in, in impoverished neighborhoods, murals under highway underpasses, community gardens, nature preserves, parks, that sort of thing. Third and finally, while I can respect the intention to use wind power for the structure, the immense amount of light pollution will provide a significant, significant disturbance to the local flora and fauna who call Guadalupe Park their home. Additionally, the structure can provide a potential hazard to local air traffic at San Jose International Airport due to the light distracting its pilots approaching, as well as potential concerns for bird strikes. All in all, I urge you to oppose the construction of Breeds of Innovation. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Uh, Brian Schmidt. Brian, did you just speak? I can't remember. I did, I'm sorry. I'm, okay. I'm all done. <laughs> Forgive me, I thought so. Okay, uh, Rathi? Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Okay, perfect. Uh, good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, Council Members and Staff. My name is Rathik Martinti. Uh, I'm a junior at Homestead High School and a member of the Sunnyvale Youth Public Policy Institute's Environmental Commission. The proposed structure may be promoted as a gift to the city, but on closer look, its construction will introduce more problems and benefits. Firstly, light pollution has plagued San Jose in recent years, and constructing a large structure with excessive lighting will add to this environmental hazard. Light pollution especially affects the migration patterns and movements of birds. Death rates for birds in San Jose area may increase as a result of the building's presence. If bird populations decline, the San Jose ecosystem will suffer dearly as a result. It should also be noted that if the proposed light infrastructure stays on during the nighttime or really throughout both the day and the nighttime, the city will have to spend more money, which presumably will come from taxpayers on electrical power. Instead of spending on a decorative structure with no apparent purpose other than hospitality, the city can use their financial resources for more socially relevant causes. Municipal funds should be spent on ventures that create social or economic benefits for the people. Clearly, Breeze of Innovation failed to do either of these. Thus, I ask the council to thoroughly consider the proposed construction of the Breeze of Innovation structure and move to reject it after deliberation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, David Manso. Thank you. I wasn't sure how to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. Great. Um, kind of good wing in this, but. Um, I think that this project has to move forward for San Jose because downtown San Jose does not have any iconic landmark. There's, there's been a, um, a continuous issue problem with San Jose where we're actually seemingly losing the title of the capital of the Silicon Valley. Uh, most of America seems to think Silicon Valley is now San Francisco. This is uh, very disturbing. We need something to get people down to the river. The only one at the river currently seems to be homeless people. And there's already a lot of light pollution right there with the arena, which is currently 120 feet, I believe. So I can't see how putting this beautiful landmark downtown in a perfect location where everyone can, can appreciate the river by going there. I can't see how this is gonna do any harm to the city. Also, there's so much light pollution already downtown I don't see how uh, you'd have to turn off all the lights downtown if you're talking about protecting bird species. And that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, sir. Uh, Nate LeBlanc, welcome. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, thank you for making this time for the public to speak on this important issue. Um, I'm Nate LeBlanc, I'm the business development manager for the San Jose Downtown Association. I'm speaking today on behalf of the association and would just like to give our full support um, to this project. Um, I feel that this project is important for the future of San Jose, um, for us to have an iconic landmark to give a, a there there, as I'm sure many people have said in the kind of crafting of the messaging around this. Um, it's, you know, we just lack for things to do as a, uh, kind of community and we need art and um, things that I think as one caller just said, um, have no apparent purpose sometimes. I think that uh, sometimes beauty is its own purpose. And so we just like to throw our full weight behind this and appreciate the uh, team that has brought this forward and all of the work that they've done with the international outreach and appreciate your time. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, I want to thank all the members of the community who have spoken, as well as those who have participated in various ways in the public outreach, uh, particularly those who participate in the community panel in the selection process. I know that was, when I hear it was a lot of time invested. Uh, I really want to thank uh, Christine Davis and John Ball and Steve Borkenhagen uh, for uh, driving this effort. It's uh, a very difficult thing to do, obviously, to try to uh, align um, public support and resources to do something uh, that is significant and lasting in the city. Uh, and I appreciate very much their ambition and their desire to contribute something to for future generations. I think that's very commendable and noble. I think there are certainly understandable concerns from the community. Uh, and those, some of those concerns I think we'll be able to address through an environmental impact report. Uh, I'll get to that in a moment. But I do want to at least take this moment to, to honor the, the spirit in which this really started, which was a group of people who thought, look, our, our city can use more public art. It can use something iconic and bold. Uh, that helps to, in some way, shape our identity. And this is an opportunity for us to engage with the community to see how we can do that. So I appreciate very much their efforts. I also want to congratulate uh, the winning uh, artists, uh, I believe Fernando Jerez and Belen Perez de Juan, uh, and commend them for their uh, very inspiring work. I think there's Look, there's, there's no question that there were a lot of good designs here. I don't pretend to be the expert in assessing what design is the best, uh, but I do know that this is something that would add significantly to our skyline uh, and it would create a statement uh, that's consistent with the desire of, I think many of those members of the community who attempted to uh, kickstart this effort several years ago. Um, I mentioned that there's gonna be an environmental impact report. Um, we have EIRs for a reason. We're gonna learn about impacts and undoubtedly light is a very significant impact on wildlife. Uh, and I think through that process, it'll give us an opportunity to understand how some of those impacts can be mitigated. Uh, I appreciate very much the spirit of the memorandum submitted by Council Member Davis, which I'll support. Uh, we're gonna learn something when we come back uh, that will enable us uh, to make better choices. And I'll certainly follow the science and I think my colleagues will as well. It's important for us to at least ask the questions so we can get to that point. Um, so I'm supportive of moving forward, recognizing there's plenty of folks, plenty of members in our community who don't support this, I get it. Um, I think there's a lot of folks who do support it that may not take the time to let us know one way or another. Uh, I, I certainly hear about it when I uh, I'm out on the street or I get phone calls here now and then, uh, but I understand that there's a certain uh, level of passion that people develop around uh, projects that's going to get them engaged uh, at different points in, in, in the process. And certainly I understand in particular now there are some real concerns in the environmental community among many of my friends in the environmental community about what this project may do. And it's important for us to understand better what it may do and what we might do to make it more uh, consistent with or more compatible with our, our collective environmental ambitions. Uh, I do have a question about something that you said, Nicole, toward the end of the presentation. It was around, I'm assuming it's charter section 1700, where apparently we hired a consultant. And I was trying to figure that out because I've read the provision several times and it relates, 1700 relates specifically to concessions or privileges uh, around permits and licenses and so forth that are granted in public parks because parks are inalienable. Okay, I get it. I don't understand why we need to hire a consultant to go tell us what the charter says. We have lawyers that are really good lawyers. In fact, they're the best municipal lawyers in the state. Uh, and I think they can tell us just fine. <laughs> I don't feel like we need to pay a consultant to do that. I also don't think it's terribly controversial about the fact that this is going to be a gift to the public. This will be a public entity. There doesn't need to be a license or 
permit to a private entity. This is going to be owned by the city. It will be part of the park, just like any statue, any fountain, anything else. You know, we don't have a section 1700 problem because somebody wants to build a piece of art in a park. So I'm trying to understand what's all that about? <laughs> yeah, I can see the confusion. Thanks, Mayor. I'm glad you asked the question. Um, so the, the that charter provision isn't about building this the facility sure can we can acknowledge anything being built in the park it's more about the long-term operation right and that charter provision prohibits even our partners like guadalupe River park conservancy and veggie lucian from having long-term agreements with us so the most we usually do with them is three years with multiple three-year extensions but we've been you know the, the the feedback we've been given is the longest we can enter into an agreement for for operating is nine years, three years with two three-year extensions. And so when you're dealing with a large project like this, or you know, one that may include a restaurant or other active, activated amenities, it's really hard to get a provider to come in and want to live in that time frame. You know, and even for funding capital projects, and this is something we hear from, from our existing partners that have contracts with the city, they are challenged in raising capital dollars because nobody wants to give capital dollars to something that to an organization that may only exist in three year increments. So I think the charter provision, to your point, isn't about the construction. It's about the um, it's about um, the operation. And I will say, first of all, we're not spending city money. It's night money. Um, but there's a lot of things wrapped up in this, and it also influences um, of our park rules. And so we wanted a consultant to be able to tease that apart, working with our city attorneys for sure, um, and, and help us tease that apart, but also make recommendations of what we think the next right move is. And I'm sure you can also appreciate that anything we, anytime we talk about this kind of provision and potential modifications to it, it, it can be very controversial with the community. And there's going to be a lot of people that have a lot of opinions about it. So we wanted to make sure we were really thoughtful as we forward with that. So that's where the background for that is. Okay. I, I mean, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with this provision because I, I led the effort to, to get 1700.1 approved by the voters in 2008, which modifies this and allows for 25 year contracts uh, for leases. But the, it seemed to me, and Nora, maybe you want to weigh in on this, but it seemed to me that the critical threshold question is, are we alienating the park? from the public in some way. And it seems to me if, you know, the basic proposition is all public parks are public, they're inalienable. <laughs> as long as this is a public sculpture or public uh, piece of art, uh, and nobody is in any way precluded from using the park or viewing the, the, the sculpture in any way, that none of this should be implicated. In other words, parks this park remains inalienable. So I don't know, Nicole, maybe if you want to help me understand better or, or Nora, like what am I missing, John? Actually, yeah, Mayor, if I, if I can jump in. Um, I, I want to just clarify that this work exists independently of this project. Um, we were already going down this path okay. and it, and it, yes, it involves the charter, but it also involves other ordinances and rules we have where we're trying to look at how are we getting in the way of these partnerships as a city? We're right. trying to clear those barriers, right? Those 25 year agreements. That's, that's where we want to go. Can there be commercial activity and things like that? And if so, how do we make it work? Um, so really this work is a broader piece of work. It just happens that it could resolve any issues with, this project being there and having some long-term operator running it because there might be a restaurant on top of it or something like that or other other business amenities or they might be responsible for example for maintaining the site and things like that and that may or may not be the city um, or even grpc it could be some other operator so it's just one aspect of it i don't i don't, I don't think we need to get into the big charter issue i don't i don't know whether it's a barrier or not but we'll have that question answered long before a shovel okay. hits the ground there I know there's enough challenges in making something like this happen. Um, I would just hate to think that the charter would be made one of them. And <laughs> I'm, I'm confident that, I, I don't know, I, I, I'm pretty confident we can overcome this, but anyway, thank you. Um, uh, let's go to Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Mayor. 
I, uh, I also want to thank the members of the public for their engagement on this issue, uh, those who spoke today and the many who wrote in. I want to acknowledge um, two letters that I know that the parks folks are uh, very, have, have been helpful in, in framing discussions and thoughts. And I know that they will continue to be. And those are the, the letters from the San Jose Parks Advocates and the recent letter from the Guadalupe River Park Conservancy. And, and they were helpful in, for me as well in thinking about some of these issues. I also, of course, wanna thank the San Jose Light Tower Corporation Board and the advisors, especially John, Steve, and Christine. Um, thank you for having a bold vision and for all of the many, many hours that you have been putting in to uh, find something appropriate and, and wonderful for our city. I do appreciate that. The community competition panel and the jury, I thank you as well for your many hours of looking at submissions. With over 950 submissions, this was not uh, choosing the winning design it must have been very difficult. And I, I, I like your pick and I wanna congratulate the winning designers as well. And as Nicole said, you know, this project has come a long way and there's still a long way to go. And I want to acknowledge that. I, I also want to acknowledge, um, I have to be frank in my comments today. I have been uh, of two minds about this project and have struggled with it because on the one hand, it's, it's awesome to me. I think, you know, this, this is having a cool looking project, having something that will bring positive attention to San Jose is, is desirable. We definitely want that. And I think we, we need that and it's exciting for our city and activating an underutilized area of, of the park is, is also a great prospect for, for our city and for um, what's coming with downtown West. On the other hand, I'm extremely sensitive to the environmental concerns that have been raised. And so in looking at that, I, I actually wanted to see what my, uh, my residents said. And I put out a quick survey over the weekend and was uh, actually surprised to get over 600 responses in just four days. So there, there, there's definitely a lot of engagement on this issue. Um, the opinions were split. And I did also find out because we had, a, we had over 400 comments of the over 600 responses, um, a lot of misunderstandings about the project. Who's paying for the project and the build, the design and the build? Who's paying for the maintenance? And then, of course, the environmental concerns that we've heard, which I, I understand are still, uh, is still a question mark because we don't, there's not a, I asked John, Steve, and Christine earlier last week, um, what is the lighting? Will it be lit all night? And they said, we don't know. We want to see what the environmental um, impact report says about that. And we need to talk more with the airport. And so I'm sensitive to the fact that we don't have all the answers yet. And I, um, I'm gonna use a couple of metaphors that came to mind for me today. I don't wanna look a gift horse in the mouth. And at the same time, I want to make sure that it's not a Trojan horse. So that was the, the purpose of my memo is to try to find a middle way. And so I'm gonna move, uh, move my memo and I want to add just a couple of things that have come up to clarify that we will have citywide outreach and that the city will devise a strategy, um, that city staff will, will devise the outreach strategy. And also, I just want to add that I hope that the design, before we get to the environmental uh, impact report, will be done to the highest standards of environmental excellence to avoid rather than just mitigate the negative impacts on the environment. So that's my motion. Second. Thank you. And I, I very much appreciate that. And again, I wanna thank everyone for the many hours, city staff, last but not least, for the hundreds of hours you have already put in and the thousand hours plus that you have estimated to go. Um, that is, I, I'm very sensitive to that as we recover from the pandemic and emerge from it, that, that we don't have, additional resources to put towards this project and it needs to be a true gift which is why in my memo I just want to be clear about the number the first modification is that the San Jose Light Tower Corporation will pay for city staff time spent 
uh, on this project. So thank you. And uh, I appreciate the second council member Foley. Thank you, council member Pros. Yeah, thank you. And just to go off of that uh, motion, I wanted to see if staff uh, could respond to the two um, additions uh, that Councilmember Davis just made. I know you had mentioned you were comfortable with her memo. I just wanted to see what your thoughts were on the, the, the two additions. Yeah, I, I think both of them are, are fine. I think, I do think there should be awareness that a, a really robust and true outreach plan is going to take some effort. Um, and it's going to take some staff time um, as well. So I would assume that would go into the reimbursement agreement with the with the group. So if we could get clarity on that, but uh, yeah, I, yes, that was my intent. Can I can I ask a clarifying question, Councilmember Davis? On that aspect, are you are you saying with respect to the EIR when we get to that point? Or are you saying ahead of that at some point? I think we'll need more clarity on um, on some of the environmentals. So I think when we get to the EIR, it makes sense. But I'd like to hear Nicole's thoughts on um, as as the design proceeds between here and the EIR. Are there are there points where it might make sense for the community to to be engaged on that? In my opinion, yes. Yes, and I think we need to, in order to do the EIR, we need a full project description. And if we don't, if we start the EIR too early, we're gonna run the risk of not, of, of having to add things in later and it's gonna make it very messy. So I think the design needs to get advanced to some, to some degree um, that would allow us to write a coherent and complete project description. Um, and that means establishing really what the footprint of the project's gonna be, what are the ancillary park improvements that might get done you know, what assets are going to be relocated and to where, you know, is there going to be a bridge or not? Like all of those, we need to nail all of those down. And I think the community wants to engage on that, particularly around the park design. Yeah, I agree. I don't think uh, at the end of the EIRs was the only outreach. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks for the clarification. Um, and thank you, staff. Uh, I, I, I do appreciate those additions and the the four modifications um, from Councilmember Davis, and and want to say thank you as well to uh, all the stakeholders involved, uh, the work of Urban Confluence, and and really the, the entire process uh, that was I know the council's interest as we uh, guided this process early on was to ensure that it was robust, and uh, certainly sh a show of appreciation for this. Uh, this gift to the city, um, and, uh, and and now what we have is a, a finalist uh, to be able to move forward, but uh, I think as described, I know there's a lot of concerns from our community uh, and appreciate our, our community speaking up in that regard, um, but we, we have still a, a bit of a, a lengthy process to go to be able to iron out a complete project as was just described, uh, not only in the EIR, but uh, in the, the, the final uh, project designs here before we even go to, to EIR. Um, and I know this is really at the, the risk of, uh, of our partners with Urban Confluence. And so uh, I, I thank them as well for continuing to, to be partners with the city in this. This is a public property, open park space. Uh, as the mayor was describing, uh, that's what it's gonna, gonna always be. And so what uh, we allow to be built here certainly um, is, is something that we need to have our, our, our diligence, our due diligence done. And uh, I think that the public process that, that we can lay out will allow for that. And, and hopefully we can, we can uh, fully mitigate all the concerns that we have heard brought up today. Um, and uh, I wanted to, to also uh, be able to mention that the letter from the Guadalupe River Park Conservancy, I, I appreciated that as well. I think very thoughtful comments uh, in, in cautions uh, in that letter. And so uh, I think to our Parks Department and Urban Confluence, um, being able to, to, to take a look at, at, at that letter, uh, as I imagine you already have, um, but continuing to sort of guide our, our process here in the next steps in being very thoughtful of, uh, of the environment that we're we're looking at this particular location that we are looking at. Uh, and so I will uh, happily support the, the motion here. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Foley. Thank you. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Urban Confluence, Steve Borkenhagen, Christine, 
Davis and John Ball for their vision and their determination to bring forth a, a real iconic project that will be a landmark for downtown. We don't have a landmark in the city of San Jose. We do have the Winchester Mystery House, that is one, but we need something downtown that will draw people in and keep people there. And this is a gift to the city that uh, we should be thoughtful in accepting, but not go in with blinders on as well. The environmental issues are very important for us to consider. So I look forward to the environmental impact report and the results of that study. Um, but I do want to recognize that this is a gift to the city that the we're a long way away or they're a long way away from realizing the fruits of their labor. The project has been selected. Uh, council moving forward today gives them the green light to go into the next step, but they still have a long ways away to raise the kind of money that they need to develop to build this project and then the ongoing uh, maintenance. So I look forward to the, the budget items and the, the provisions that Council Member Davis put in, the, in her memo, I think are really important. Um, Nicole, I do have a question for you. You said something that um, uh, regarding fundraiser, fundraising that uh, made me uh, take notice. And that is that you said the giving levels need to be consistent with city policy. What does that mean? Yeah, that's a good question. So we've had, we do have projects that have come forward and wanted to do fundraising. And, and I, I, if I said city policy, I misspoke. I mean, but I think there's, that we need to establish, the project's going to need to establish a fundraising plan and give and get levels. And we want to make sure that's relatively consistent with, you know, whose name goes on this and whose name goes in plaques. For example, at SAP Center, you know, there's limits on where they can garner money from for fundraising in terms of, you know, cigarette companies, that kind of stuff. So there's just some amount of thoughtfulness that as staff we put in to our, you know, what, how the fundraising strategies work. That's what I was trying to, trying to. Okay. So they're going to, I'm sure they're already working on a fundraising plan and have thought about who they can target for funding, but you're saying as far as identification, selling the name, anything like that, like we do with shark, the shark tank, et cetera, there's a process for that. Okay. Exactly. I, I just, I just wanted to make sure that urban confluence isn't limited by potentially an archaic uh, fundraising mechanism that they may, may have set up 40 years ago that wouldn't be valid today. No, no, that's not, that's not the case. We don't have anything that firm, um, which also makes us need to be thoughtful about it every time it comes up. For sure. Okay. And, uh, uh, actually, I guess uh, that's it for me. Everybody has really pretty much said uh, what I wanted to say. I'm happy to support this. I'm excited to see this come forward. Uh, I watched all the very the the entries or the entries that were narrowed down to the 40 plus, and then to see the three and then the one. Uh, the breeze of innovation is beautiful and has a lot of movement and uh, can attract the kind of uh, can attract people to come and wander around. There's a lot of wandering around spaces in it too. So I look forward to it as it moves along. And particularly, I do look forward to the environmental impact report. With that, I'm happy to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Randis. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, and I just want to thank the, the staff for their report. It was 24 pages long and so, it, it kind of signals to me the, the level of work that you'll have to um, commit to. Um, and so th that is one of my questions as I was pondering about this. I know it's, it's, um, it's difficult to make a decision um, whether we accept a gift, but for me, it, one, it's important to know what is our st staff um, time commitment? What does that timeline look like? Um, and what about the other projects that had been waiting in, in, uh, in the queue? 
Um, specifically, I'm going to ask about my own district, and we have a Meadow Fair master plan that's been on hold uh, for some time now. Um, and so when I think about equity um, in terms of projects, I want to make sure that my um, folks who are on the east side uh, receive the, the, the care and attention that they deserve. And so what is that staff anticipated time? Uh, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question, council member, um, because I have to say the staffing is probably the, the thing that I struggle with the most for this project for the, for this very reason. Um, so what, what I've talked with the team about and what I'm proposing is the idea that, you know, I can't, I, I don't want to have to put other projects on hold to be able to support this project. So our, you know, expectation is that we are going to enter into an agreement pretty quickly with, with, the group, with the corporation where, you know, similar to what Google did during their entitlement process, right, where each department talks about what resources they need and the cost associated with them, and the corporation needs to write a check, and then we can take that check to the budget office to say, we need staff to support this project. So I see us adding staff specifically to support this project using funds from the, from the project. Um, so that we keep going, so that my the rest of my team can keep going with the 150 other projects that are in our in our in our queue. Mm -hmm. So you you don't anticipate um, any of those projects um, getting delayed because of this project. You think that um, because the, the of this contract that you'll work through ahead of time, that you will have the resources ahead, um, or the the staff that's needed to actually move this along. Um, which sounds very reasonable, um, uh, Nicole. Um, I, I just also wonder, uh, because those folks who are going to come in new are going to um, obviously, you know, be new to the city of San Jose, um, how long it'll take for them, you know, the learning curve on, on that and, um, and how that'll impact the, the other work. Um, so basically, you know, will this slow down the other work that that you just cited right now. My my plan is for it to not, um, you know, for me to be working directly with the new staff that are dedicated to this project. Um, you know, I've also been exploring, or at least in my head, exploring um, the idea of a retiree rehire, perhaps, so someone who could come in who would already be familiar with the city system could get up to speed relatively quickly and be able to support the project. Uh, but I've been I've been solely supporting this project for the three years it's been here because I haven't wanted to drag my staff away from other projects. But I think at this point we're going to need to there need there's going to need to be a dedicated project manager. Got it. Okay. Well, that's a great idea to have some of the retiree and um, rehired employees so that they can kind of come in um, and not uh, lose a lot of pace there. Um, and I guess, you know, the last piece is, you know, what, what will we do to ensure that no matter what, that this doesn't become a financial burden on the city? Um, because once we are invested and once we, you, you know, we're, you said three years into this process, um, we've already made an investment. Um, I, I see your time spent on this as an investment. Um, and so what is that breaking point? When will we know that this is not uh, something that, uh, that, when will we know when this is, becomes a financial burden on the city? How will we realize that and how would you bring that forward to the council? Yeah, I think, um, I, I think there's gonna be multiple touch points back to council through this process, right? And through the project development. Um, and so, I think there's going to be an ample opportunity along the way for us to talk about this more. I don't think I can today predict how it will all unfold or where that, you know, where a pinch point might happen that, you know, gives us pause as a city. I think all I can continue to do is kind of day by day work through the process and work through the project and see where it lands us. And I, and I, and that's hard to say because, you know, the engineer in me always wants to know, you know, where we're going, but, uh, but I think for this and something this complex, it's, um, I, I don't know that we can say that for sure right now. I think we have to take it kind of one step at a time. And if I can add, Council Member, um, mm -hmm. in, in addition to Nicole saying, um, you know, th that we don't quite know just yet, we're too early to know, um, I will tell you that it is the corporation's intent to raise the funding above and beyond the project expense to create an endowment 
that would fund ongoing the operations, that it would not increase the maintenance fees to the city for this project, that they would create and give, and you would have to accept as a city council that endowment. So you would have to, we would have to all agree that, that they're putting aside enough money and the interest off that money or whatever is gonna be enough over the long term that it won't be a financial drain on the city. But as Nicole also said, we'll have opportunities to look at that as it, as it develops. Right, uh, and I'm glad you, you you brought that up, um, uh, John, because I do think about, you know, when we have, oops, I'm so sorry that my phone, um, I do like Chardet, so that's my ringtone. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I appreciate that point that you've just brought up, and I, I do think ahead of time in terms of, you know, every, everything has a lifetime, um, and uh, we just don't know what that um, maintenance will be, but it sounds like the, the foundation that will be set up will, we, uh, that will ins be insured, uh, that will ensure us that, that there's going to be some fundraising or there's some sources or that there's going to be enough um, revenue raised through this that it'll cover future um, maintenance. And I guess, you know, it, I know it's too early to, to figure out what that maintenance is, um, but these are the questions that you know that that I'm thinking about. H how do we know we're going to be able to afford um, uh, the maintenance in, in the future? Will there be a 100% assurance of of a coverage through that through that uh, foundation? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have an answer to those questions. You know, it's, we're again, we're very early. You know, the presumption is they can raise the amount of money that's going to that's going to be able to meet the maintenance requirements. That's their goal and that's their plan. Now, to the degree to which they succeed at doing that or convincing us that they've done that, that'll be a discussion we'll have and a decision you'll get to make. And whether or not you agree that this is going to this is going to help us through the life of the project or it's not enough, you know, but we're just not there yet, I guess, is the point. So we'll have our chances to try to figure that out ahead of us. Um, and we don't have to accept it if, if it doesn't work for us. Right. Um, and and what, what part of the process would that be, John? I have to ask Nicole where that might land. It's hard to say. Yeah, I think this is why part of the reason why I want the schedule. <laughs> so I know, you know, we start, I, I like the engineering you. <laughs> when these I want to know too. <laughs> start to fall and develop. I do know that the project team has already hired a consultant to help them think about revenue generation and and management of the site. So, you know, they're, they're already thinking about it for sure. I just don't, you know, I think until the design is more fully vetted and further along, it's, it's probably really hard for us to, to identify maintenance costs and it, with any clarity, so. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, and, and I appreciate um, Council Member Davis, you've you included in your memo that uh, the project would come through NSC on a quarterly or and the Parks Commission periodically maybe, um, part of that could be um, in returning to the NSC on a quarterly basis that they report uh, potential burdens, uh, financial potential burdens um, that um, that we discover through through the process. Uh, this being, you know, a process I think that we haven't gone through um, as of late. Um, so I wonder if if you would be um, open to a friendly amendment just to receive some of that. Um, review back, or or it, I don't know that it needs to be an, an amendment, but um, for staff to be able to include that kind of analysis back to the committee. I, I don't think it needs to be an amendment. I was clear, I was, for me at least, I assumed that um, the check-ins with the co with the committee would be all-encompassing if, if any issues, you know, arose, and that was why I wanted to make it quarterly, because this is such a big project and so many, uh, mm -hmm. so many unknowns and things to be worked out. So I fully expect that Nicole would would bring those forward. But if if uh, if you would feel more comfortable putting it in there, I'm I'm happy to make that amendment. Uh, uh, no, I'm I'm okay with with um, I see staff uh, committing to that. I you know it doesn't seem like that that's going to create a burden. Correct, Nicole and John. Uh, correct. I think one one point of clarification I wouldn't mind, Councilmember Davis. You know, when I hear quarterly reporting, I'm thinking, generally speaking, verbal report. 
written reports only as needed because of a major project milestone. Is that acceptable? Yeah, that was what I was was thinking. That's what we get in t and &E, we get a regional uh, uh, transportation, like quarterly regional transportation activities report. And um, there's there's usually a memo, but it's not an extensive, extensive memo. Okay, thank you. And Nicole, I, I just want that connected to um, a memo at some point or another so that the council can actually, or the committee members can provide that type of feedback because if it's a verbal report, um, it's just accepting a, a report. Um, the the last question I have, and I hope that my colleagues can can um, just uh, allow me uh, some additional time here. Um, and this is part of the the question around um, the Im the environmental impact. And so my question is, um, come right back to you, since Councilman. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Right absolutely. Okay, Thank great. You. Councilman Cohen. Yeah, I just have one question and follow up on that discussion we were just having about. Um, about the funding of PRNS staff time, because that's obviously a big concern, I think, of many of us. Um, the, the item on here says you work together to establish a pay fee schedule. Do we have any feel for how that works? Because you know, do they have money to start paying for it right away so that you're not getting too far down doing all of the things that need to get done right now, uh, you know, in order to, because obviously we don't want to, de to detract from your time Quickly. So, how, so how would that work? How would it how would it play out to come to that agreement and start getting resources from them immediately to cover the costs for moving forward? I, for me, feel like that is priority number one for me to you know my next meeting with the with the corporation will be, you know, what is the staffing needs over the next fiscal year? And I see it as something we have to talk about year by year because of the the project could take so many directions, but. I see that as the as the priority, um, and trying to execute an agreement, you know, within the next couple of months if we can, um, assuming we have a good template to work from. And do you have to come back to council then at that point to, with an agreement so that that's covered in terms of using that to take staff? It, it probably Nicole probably depends on the amount of the agreement. Um, yeah. But if we do, we would. Um, but to also answer your question, council member. They have been fundraising all along, so they have they have money in the bank, um, and they've actually already already issued a payment to us um, for uh, some of our time. I, I think it was twenty four thousand dollars or something along those lines um, for an initial for initial billing, if you will. So, um, and that was thanks to uh, Councilman uh, Perales, you know, saying, "Hey guys, come on." So they're they're on board with this. They have money in the bank. I do think we can work this all out. Yeah, that's what yeah. I thought I just wanted to confirm. And I saw no, I and they actually they are in the audience. So if you want to hear from them directly, you're welcome to. But they actually texted me to say that they def, they they do expect to advance us funds to keep working. Well, that's good. That's kind of what I was hoping we'd hear from them. And if that's good enough to hear it through you, that's I'm glad to get that answer. Um as 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 you, we can all tell from this conversation, we're in like the fourth inning of a nine inning game. So there, there's a lot more we have to learn and, and a lot more, you know, um I's to dot and T's to cross before we would get to the point of being final on this project. And I look forward to learning the answer to a lot of the questions we have. And I and I'm hopeful that the uh, corporation will, you know, will be uh, amenable to all to the suggestions that come in as a result of the EIR to make sure that we are doing a project that's both uh, interesting, iconic, but also um, respectful to the community and, and, and the environment around it. So um, thank you for for uh, the presentation and the detail. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Mahan. Thanks, Mayor, and um, yeah, I really, really agree with the sentiment of Councilmember Cohen's comments there. I think there's still a lot to learn. I'm sure there will still be a lot of scrutiny as we look at the proposed timeline and the EIR, of course. And so, looking forward to learning more. Uh, definitely want to, you know, thank the project organizers for the incredible amount of work that's gone into this, and congratulations to the the winning design and, and the artists behind it. Um, I had a, and thanks to Councilor uh, uh, Davis, by the way, for for kind of outlining some some of the key parameters as as we go forward. I think I think she captured the key questions. I had sort of a tactical question that Councilmember Cohen's uh, question made me think of, which is, do, do you anticipate in the timeline that we'll get in the 120 days? 
that there will be project milestones in terms of fundraising that would that would impact kind of the, the, the status of the project. Will we be saying certain amounts of money need to be raised and or other my, key milestones for this to move forward? And is there, I guess what I'm looking for is a way to ensure that the park doesn't end up being encumbered for years that something, for something that ultimately doesn't come to fruition, though I you know, very much hope that we have a you know, beautiful public art installation there, but you know, just, just to protect the residents. So is that, Nicole, I see your head nodding. Yeah, no, because I think it's a great question. It's one that's very much on, on our mind as well. Um, and I'm actually going to invite John Ball um, maybe to jump in to answer that question. Um, my hope is that, yes, I very much want milestone fundraising schedule, but I, I don't know where they stand with that. So I'm not sure. Can we pull him over from the attendee side? Yeah, John, if John, can, if you raise your hand so the clerk can see you, just let us know when you're on. He's there now. Okay. Sean, I, I think you're still muted. Are you? There we go. Uh, I'm looking for the uh, video button. There it is. <laughs> so uh, thank you. So fundraising is always on our minds. And we, yes, we need to raise more money for the following items the environmental impact report and the studies that are part of those. We need to advance our design uh, so that we can start the EIR because there's a lot of design decisions that we need to make as was pointed out by GRPC letter and other comments that have been made in the last couple of weeks. We do need to have our design advance so we can start the EIR. So there's been a lot of comments made about not using CEQA to mitigate issues, but design good bird safe practices and lighting design that's not impactful to the environment up front. So we have a lot of fundraising to do before we get the capital. Okay, so I think I'll stop there. I know time is short, but uh, as part of our plan that we have to submit within 120 days, uh, we will have a, a good finite fundraising plan and a schedule that has a lot of milestones in it. Thank you. That's that's great to hear. And I and, and I think obviously this is a, a ways out, but when you get to the capital stage, I think having a sense of, of you know number of years and 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 what the targets we're trying to hit would just, just be helpful for everyone to know. But obviously that's that's a ways out. So thanks again, John. And that was the only question I had. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, further questions? Councilmember Reynas, did you get your question answered? No, I, I didn't, Mayor. So I, I would like to ask, um, and basically it's it's um, how much light is too much light? And I guess th this is part of also the exploration of, of in of the environmental impact, but that would be my question. Um, this, this project seems to um, be based on, on a light element Am I frozen? No, you were hearing me fine. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I was. I am guessing that the answer to that is going to come when we get the CIR back. But John, yeah. or... I would say, yeah, I would. I would say that's true. I, I, I think we need lighting experts to answer that question. I'm not sure any of us here are able to to answer it. And I think you know there was some initial lighting study work done by the project as part of the design competition, but. Um, know that there's a design i think it needs to get revisited and evaluated in, in in detail with the with the appropriate consultants and that will happen for sure as part of the eir process yeah and maybe we can ask john ball to speak to this real quick because i believe they have a consultant that's been working with them already on issues like this is that right john yeah we do thank you uh, i just want to say because there were so many public comments that are based on the assumption that it's going to be a brightly lit structure that's going to be done in an environmentally harmful way I just want the city council to know that there is no design information uh, that exists today that implies uh, any light intensity, any lighting schedule, any lighting colors, or any lighting direction. That is what we're going to develop next. And so uh, we do have a team in place. We have lighting consultants and we have people uh, that do biological lighting studies. And that's going to, uh, we're going to use that to inform what we can and cannot do. 
Great. Um, th thank you for the for the answer. And uh, listen, I, I supported this when he, um, I think you all initially um, came in a couple of years ago and suggested uh, to create um, uh, something that would be uh, symbolic of San Jose and would help us with our with our identity. I always think about the hearts that are in San Francisco that are very iconic. Um, and I, I think how that um, element brings all kinds of different neighborhoods together because you can find one of those hearts. Obviously, the, the biggest one is around the wharf, but there's there's um, these hearts throughout all of all of San Francisco reflecting that um, specific neighborhood. And so, you know, I, this is this is the project that was chosen. Um, uh, it obviously, it was very competitive. Uh, I'll tell you, as a San Jose native, I don't know that I find myself um, um, identifying with the project, but, you know, I'm not a very artistic person, and so, it, uh, and beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and so I will let that be for those experts, um, but I, I do want to um, recommend and caution everyone um, in terms of the outreach and the engagement to the community. Um, because it sounds like they want to participate. Um, uh, at this point, it's, you know, there's some parameters here in, uh, in terms of what this project is going to look like. So I don't know what, what that uh, community engagement will result in. Um, but I'm hoping that our parks department can be part of the, the outreach. They know our community. Uh, I don't know if this also can be reimbursed at some point um, or another. I, uh, because we have you, you all haven't uh, completed that contract, but is the idea that the parks department would also help with the community engagement? Um, my understanding was, yeah, that we should take a leadership role in it. Okay, um, and, and I I feel very comfortable with with uh, your responses, Nicole. You've you've answered, and and John, thank you for assuring me of some of the questions that I've, I have, and I think a lot of our residents have. And, and lastly, I'll, I'll just say this, uh, I want San Jose to have an identity to, that brings us all together. Um, San Jose Sharks um, is part of that identity, and I love to see that, uh, of, um, that look in so many different ways if people have taken it and, and just run with it. Um, so you see it in different neighborhoods, and it's a reflection of, of what that neighborhood uh, loves and values, right, connected to the San Jose Sharks. Um, and, and I want this project to also be the same, um, but we have to make sure that we engage our community. And, um, and I think we also have to be very sensitive that we're in the middle of a pandemic and people are dying and people are sick. And that this investment, the optics of this investment might not be favorable um, within some communities. Um, and, uh, and so I'll, I'll support the motion um, that's on the floor. I, I think uh, this is far from finalizing this particular project, but I wanna give you my input um, because I, like I said, I, I don't know what else to say other than the optics are, are important and the engagement to our community are also equally as important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Jimenez. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just very quickly, just to simply say, appreciate everyone's input on this, uh, all the folks that have brought this uh, project to, to, to this stage, and obviously the community uh, folks that showed up and expressing their concerns. Just wanted to publicly say that I, I support uh, Councilmember Davis's memo. I think it uh, it's a good middle path, and uh, I look forward to seeing how this develops. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think it's all been said. So we will uh, vote on the motion from Council Member Davis and we'll be back. I see that there is a member of the community that has not spoken, it appears. Um, I'm sorry, I think that we'll, we'll, we'll come back to you, I think on the next item. Um, yeah, why don't we go forward and vote on this? Yes. <clears throat> Yes. Alice? Yes. Owen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? 
Hi. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. We're going to take a break now for dinner. Why don't we return at 6.30? Does that work all right, Dave? Yes, yeah, sorry. Thank you, Mayor. That works. Okay, great. Mayor, we'll start Mayor, I don't know if this next item is going to take that long. Um, if we could potentially get that. Well, I think we got two items that have presentations, 3.6 and 8.1. And they're both going to probably involve some community input, I'd expect. And 3.6 is time. You, we have it time certain at 6. Obviously, that's probably a little out of whack, but that's probably got to go first. Yeah. Okay. I was meaning 8.1, not 3.6, but. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you.